love how you got all that set up and all that. Hello, welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. The Jason Cabinet Experience is brought to you by Cabinet's HR. At Cabinet's HR, we, we provide HR to companies with 49 or fewer people. Our guest today is Ken Morimuto. Ken, thanks for being here. Yeah, wonderful to be here, Jason. Good to see you again. Yes, yeah, so we're going to start right up until, right? So I don't know your age or your generation, but I'm, I'm in my 50s, Generation X. And I went from Pong, which back in the day was like the most amazing thing ever, uh -huh. to now all the AI stuff going on, right? In like 50 years, right? And I don't think people realize the technology advances that humans have done those 50 years. And my thing is like, I think what we did in those 50 years, we're probably going to do in the next five or 10 years, right? Yes. Can you just comment on that? Like, just go with that. Yeah, I mean, um, we're definitely in an exponential, like, curve that's been accelerated. Um, thanks to NVIDIA, thanks to compute, thanks to data. I mean, I, I ever since I've been following this crazy trajectory, um, you know, the simulation theory is quite uh, a, a valid theory, in my opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's accelerating rapidly, driven by the power of compute uh, data centers. And so, you know, we're going to see just incredible exponential quantum leap uh, progress in technology, which is extremely scary, but for me, quite exciting. So we're, we're talking about not knowing what's real and what's actually synthetic or uh, created by AI um, when you watch videos or, uh, you know, when you watch any type of content, it's going to be quite, we live in interesting times. And to me, talking about, about the, the um, multiverse theory, what do you want, simulation theory, it's amazing how many, like, you know, what we call like smart, smart people, like, I like really believe this, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I listened to Joe Rogan podcast earlier today, this guy named, this guy here, I don't know if, I don't know if you know this guy or not. No. Okay. So he was like, like he sold his company like a lot of money. He's like really big in the simulation. There's a lot right? of guys that believe in. I mean, I mean, it's know, the, Elon, to me, that's the day. Yeah. Peter Diamandis. I mean, a um, lot of, a lot of great computer scientists and AI people. I mean, it's a theory. I mean, it's hard to prove. Um, that's kind of hard not to prove it I, either, right? Yeah. I actually went down a rabbit hole of just like understanding um, the nature of reality and uh, everything from evolution to simulation and, you know, I even grew up pretty religious growing up. So I, I was at a point one time I was quite religious when I was in, when I was younger. But I mean, they're all valid, interesting theories. Um, at the end of the day, I, I've actually stopped really spending too much time on it because it's sort of a a, a, a theory you can't prove really. It's like it's a fun rabbit hole. But it's fun. Down, it's fun. I mean, just a fun. Um, uh, Fun things to really think about long walks and my thing is it's like whoever the fuck is playing me you're like fuck you step your fucking game up right <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you know go get some cheat codes or something right yeah it's um yeah that's you know like the theory of npc and um i mean i think in you know when when right now i mean there's autonomous agents right so you know one can argue that somebody's really not controlling so it's a combination of you know um you know, reinforcement learning and non reinforcement learning and just, uh, yeah, as a Thompson agent, you're, you're literally basically playing out many different scenarios and, yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, yeah, it's, I'm mean, just like, when you came here, right, you decided, what if you would have left two minutes early? What if instead of going like 45 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, right? And all these decision points, you know, plus some are minor, some are major, I think, you know. Like, yeah. So I think about that too. I mean, I, I went down a rabbit hole uh, regarding free will and determinization, you know, uh, determinization. And, and so, um, you know, if we have a supercomputer, one can argue that, you know, from the, some a lot of physicists, a lot of, a lot of uh, talented, you know, scientists argue that we live in a very deterministic world, meaning that literally from the big bang, everything is pretty much pre you know, predetermined from the law of physics. Um, so with the enough computer supercomputer, you can actually, you can actually know what I'm going to do, but you know, free will is, is illusion in that way that, you know, you think that you made these choices, but 
did we really right so i've gone down a rabbit hole um uh as well so yeah we can, you know, we can nerd out about that as oh well. yeah oh yeah definitely so many things nerd yeah. out and like yeah. you know like 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 growing up religious you know like you know all all the the christianity jewish or whatever religion they say like a god created us right it like there's this omnipotent you know loving god create us i don't know right because like all these there's these always different stories right these fables so called right mm -hmm. so i don't know if i believe that, believe that but then again like i refuse to believe like two atoms just bang together and create everything right like neither one kind of makes sense to me right yeah they're all pretty you know it, it it's hard to put your put my to really you know have conviction for if i really deeply think about it it's, it's quite uh i mean what what a it has to be a one in quadrillion trillion trance of two atoms that's randomly in the middle of nowhere clicking together and all this stuff creates right yeah i don't know i mean you know with enough time and yeah yeah with enough chaos i mean a lot of interesting things happen um i'm not a domain expert in that but i mean my just to make, make it clear i mean i i don't know i mean it, these are, are are theories i like to entertain i mean i'm you know i i i like to follow the science as much as possible and uh um you know i i don't know you know, sometimes I entertain simulation. I entertain, you know, other interesting theories. Just, just as entertainment. Yeah. So back to the tech in the last 50 years, right? Do you think we'll be able to like uh, surpass that amount of tech in the next five years, ten years? What's the call? Like when I think tech advances every two years or doubles? That's Moore's law. Yes, right? Moore's law. Yeah. You, yeah. Is that that's a real thing, right? I mean, it still is. I mean, right now with uh, you know, I think Moore's law is like the number of transistors double, and so compute you know, every two years so or 18 months. So um, the, the speed of compute increases uh, by double um, and also decreases the cost by like significantly. Um, and so given, you know, all the cloud infrastructure from AWS, Azure, um, and, and NVIDIA chips, I mean, you know, with all the parallel computing that's happening, I mean, it's def definitely uh, Moore's law is still Live and true. In fact, I went to the Jensen Huang's uh, opening, San Jose's um, at the NVIDIA GTC, and and he spoke about that. You know, NVIDIA actually accelerated Moore's law uh, exponentially. You know, through their GPU. So, you know, he argued he had a really compelling slide that, in fact, Moore's law has been accelerated through NVIDIA GPU innovation, which is, you know, again, AI is just simply computation. And data. So when you have a lot of computation, and one thing interesting that Sam Ullman said is that the biggest bottleneck is actually energy potentially, right? Because you know, you know, energy still is is a key driver to compute, right? To keep the servers and everything humming. So um, I think Moore's law is going to be hindered by you know constraints of potential energy, given all the you know massive demand that uh, you know the, the AI model requires. So, in my mind, I don't think the average American or average human realizes how fast technology is advancing and what the future holds, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that can be done, like, kind of like educate them, like, hey, you might want to pay attention to this. This is going to change your life. You know, AI is coming, you know, like all that kind of stuff, or just. Yeah. I think Jensen said uh, something um, really compelling that AI is not going to take your job, uh, but the person that knows how to use AI, right? It's a tool will take your job. So I think it's extremely important for for people to, you know, level up um, and understand what these tools can, you know, potentially help, right, in your in your profession and be able to leverage, right? So can imagine like, you know, you don't have access to a computer or a calculator and you're doing everything by by hand or memory. I mean, you're going to be completely disadvantaged not knowing how to use a tool. So, you know, leveraging AI um tools is going to be extremely important for anybody, you know, and, you know, trying to, you know, ensure that uh, they can be competitive in, in this job market. That's a good point. Like, how do we keep the, and maybe it's just a free market that takes care of yourself, right? Capitalism, whatever, but how do we keep the house become even more greater halves and the have nots coming a greater have nots? Because house going to have access to yeah. all this stuff, you know, I mean, example I use, like you're in, even if you're like economic disadvantage in Seattle, you have access to everything, right? Versus you live in a farm in, you know, small town Arkansas on a farm with 25 people, you might have access to everything. Of course, there's Zoom and stuff like that, but it's still not the same, I think, right? How do you keep that? You're just like, okay, that's a free market. 
Yeah, I mean, there's going to be, you know, a huge, I mean, it's happening now, right? There's a huge discrepancy between people, you know, even wealth, right? Given, you know, driven by, you know, technological, like, understanding and having a STEM background. Um, and so you see that now, right? People who are uh, well-versed and, and uh, have access to, you know, computers and internet access and, uh, um, you know, they can, you know, they're, they're definitely, you know, and people who have not, right? I mean, it's going to be a huge, I think, uh, you know, challenge moving forward, right, for, for, for the world. So kind of off subject, but kind of on. So on Thursday, was it Thursday? Thursday, I was at a networking event called New Tech Northwest run by Brett Green, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like do every month, like two people get, do do 10 minute pitch, right? And part of the thing he does, like there's 75 people there. He'll say, uh, if you're looking for a job, stand up, say your name we're looking for, right? Like 75 people there, I'm spitballing. Maybe 35 people stood up. 33 were software developers, right? Yeah, yeah. And then who's hiring? No one stood up, right? I mean, what do you, I know there's rumors out there if you're a software developer, you like AI is going to do your job, like basic coding, you know? So what, what's your advice to software developers starting out? So like all in on AI on Python or there's still like places for them, like build websites and do like, where we can still like basic junior developer skills. Yeah. Actually, I had a, I had this conversation um, with a friend uh, who's an AI scientist. I mean, the biggest disruption that's happening, you know, uh, where AI is disrupting is actually the uh, developer, um, you know, job market. And um, I think I read this crazy statistic that I think 40% of Indian uh, computer science grads are having a hard time finding a job. And before, right, I mean, all your parents are telling you, like, become a doctor, become a developer, because you're going to be, you know, uh, comfortable and set and be able to find a nice wife or husband. And, you know, all that's been completely, like, turned upside down. And, um, and I talk with a lot of my 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 brilliant uh, you know founders or or developers and you know a good programmer can you know leveraging Copilot can do 10x of you know in terms of speed and performance and so um, and the key is like you have to still be a domain expert and so you know if a good programmer can do 10x like you're not going to need a a junior or somebody who's pretty inexperienced right so. And the AI is just even getting better. So I think, I mean, again, it's, you know, who would have thought that AI would disrupt, you know, the people who have a computer science degree. Like I would never thought that. I thought it would be like, you know, drivers and like warehouse workers. And, uh, but no, it's actually, you know, making a major uh, impact in the job market for developers. Yeah. So, Jupiter. so with the 10 times results, right? Suppose there's a non-tech founder out there, right? And they're looking at hire developers. Is there, is there any way they can figure out, suppose they need, there's like two people they're interviewing, right? Is there a way for a non-tech founder to figure out which one is the 10 times person versus like this average coder? Yeah, these guys can. I'm not a developer and I'm not, you know, very technical, but, you know, my, you know, my friends who are, you know, very talented developers, I mean, they, it's like, playing tennis, right? You can hit some tennis balls and you see how they hit it back. And you know, because they have that, they have that domain expertise, they have that talent. So they know, they can recognize if you have that, you know, that, that ability. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of these developers, you know, I was actually even talking to a, a very, um, a CEO who, you know, hires, uh, developers, mostly out of like I, IIT, which is one of the top, schools in India. And, uh, you know, he looks for, for the, for what he told me was he looks for people with actually very high academic, you know, performance. He said, that's been a really good signal. Um, as well as, you know, his, his, his other methods of interviewing, but yeah, people who, who are good programmers can know and, and be able to curate. So, talent. so either the fear or the hope is like, AI is going to take, you know, make some, like take some jobs, right. Jobs that people don't want to do. Like, you know, like, Picking agriculture, maybe cleaning mm -hmm. bathrooms, but is there a job we don't want AI to do? Like, do we want AI like being the TSA security person at the airport? You want AI robots like doing heart surgery? Is there any jobs like you're like, man, I don't know about this right here. We still need humans to do this. I mean, honestly, I think that AI will be able to do better 
that most people in different in certain functions on almost any task, right? I mean, not right now, like, you know, for surgery, things like that, but, you know, the models, you know, they, they're getting better, right? I mean, with access to almost unlimited compute, you know, um, I believe that AI is going to be better than, and, you know, it, a lot of people say this, Elon says this, um, you know, Sam Altman, a lot, a lot of the smartest people in this space, you know, obviously they might be biased, right? But, um, but I, I can't think of any use case where uh, AI cannot, in in a very narrow function, can you know cannot outperform humans. So that's kind of scary. Yeah, I, think. I asked them on the podcast one time. I asked them like, if you had to pick, you had to suppose you had to have open heart surgery on yourself, right? You picked like a human doctor or AI. Like, man, I'm picking the human doctor, right? Yeah, I, for I, now. I mean, but then I said, okay, let's switch it up. Mm -hmm. What if you found out the human doctor for this last of this class and has two or three um, malpractice lawsuits coming. You're like, uh, I, I would might actually, go, I might go AI now. No, no, I would actually take the best is human and the AI. It's it's the human AI collaboration, right? It's the, you know, it's like AI is just a tool, right? But you still need that human judgment to make sure that you know there's some edge cases that you know they don't, um, you know, that they haven't seen before. So the best doctors will be the doctors who are good or whatever, but they leverage technology to make their, you know, to, to solve their specific mission problem. So, um, and that's, that's, yeah, I think that's how great AI works right now is, you know, just like co-pilot, right? You still need you know, the human to sort of make sure that you can do a quick QA check. Um, you know, I use um, AI for writing, you know, and they tell me with the cold start, and then I go through and edit and clean it up. And it makes me two, three times faster, right? Um, so it's it's a combination is, is I think, in, but again, it depends on the use case, right? So AI is like saying the internet, like it's a buzzword, people throw it around. <laughs> um, but it's like, what, you know, what's the use case? Like what's, you know, what's the application of that technology, right? So, and then I, then we can sort of, maybe dive deeper. Do you think there's any limit on what AI can do or whatever humans can code or whatever, what, what do you do with AI? Do you think it's limitless or is there a limit to it? I mean, I, I don't have the, 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 the science, deep science and physics background. I mean, you know, if you look at history, we've constantly been pushing the envelope in terms of, you know, progress, uh, compute, innovation. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, right now, as we stand, if you look at the exponential curve that Ray Kurzweil and, and uh, <laughs> Jensen Huang, you know, shows in terms of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the compute uh, exponential growth. I mean, again, with, with enough compute and power, there's a lot of breakthroughs that can happen. So I think the only constraint, again, would be Potentially energy, right? If you don't have enough energy to run compute, then you're gonna you're gonna run into a potential wall for the potential AI. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so whose problem is this to solve or to fix? Right? I'm making this up, right? Like, suppose I mean, we pick any industry, like janitors or truck drivers. And suppose like we we I think there's 250,000 truck drivers mm -hmm. in the United States. And suppose like on January first. They all get laid off and put AI robots in there. Like, who's studying the problem, trying to solve the problem? Like, there's 250,000 people being unemployed, right? Is anyone like studying? Like, and I think the government's too slow to like, solve the problem, right? Because the government's so far behind, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the tech companies should do it because that would be kind of biased, I guess. But like, who's like trying to solve the problem? Okay, when the robots come, robot AI comes, these jobs are like, the people are replaced. Like, are we doing a universal basic income or like find different jobs? Or like, are we, is a truck driver going to be no longer a truck driver? But he's going like, to learn how to do the AI and behind, right? Yeah. Like who's the responsibility is that you think? So I worked on a lot of self-driving cars when I was at scale AI, right? Like a lot of the lighter projects, semantic exploitation, um, or you know, all the top ones, right? Waymo, Zooks, um, Tesla. I think we're so far off from uh, massive adoption of, of self-driving cars. Um, and we're seeing some stuff at Waymo and Zooks and out there. I think the biggest constraint or challenge for massive adoption is actually uh, uh, government regulation. Um, 
I saw a great Lex Veeman podcast uh, on this with the, I think the CEO founder of iRobot. And so just imagine that that uh, self-driving AI cars are 10 times, uh, statistically are 10 times safer, but you know, you get in one car accident and it kills some, you know, uh, person, the regulators, the, you know, the conservatives, or I mean, just people who are maybe anti-tech, you know, um, you know, they're going to, you know, there's going to be a lot of, uh, 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 regulation saying, you know, we're not going to trust these evil machines. I mean, there's going to be a lot of propaganda around that. So the bar that AI has to actually achieve, you know, massive adoption for self-driving is significantly, um, I mean, it has to be like 99.9999%. Like, look what happened at Wayne, not Cruise, right? Like, they had that one incident where they dragged some poor lady under and they basically were shut down. And that was like an edge case that, you know, AI models are going to have a hard time really, um, you know, identifying. So I think we're still far away from, from, uh, so you see how we're like 10 years, 15 years, two or three years. Um, I, mean, I, know you can't I, I don't know. Answer. I don't know. I, I still think, I mean, I initially thought that this would be happen now, right? Being involved in, in course, LIDAR projects yeah. and look at the map, billions and billions of dollars investment from all the software training projects. It's insane. It was like yeah. a, almost a massive bubble because the, the ROI has not materialized from the investments. Um, and uh, even Tesla, like recently, they, they, uh, you know, Elon, they, you know, he's first doing LIDAR, then radar. And now he's basically throughout you know, all his different methodologies and you know, leveraging these 5 million drivers to collect data as a different, using open source models. And it's from what I understand, I haven't read into all the literature, but I still think we're actually safe there. Um, but initially that was a huge uh, concern, right? Because like I said, statistically, there are millions of people who make a, you know, who, who make a living off of driving, yeah. right? whether it's long haul or taxi or Uber, but I think we're still, Far off, but I could be wrong. I mean, what I know, right? What's that thing called? Uh, is a term for like you know, like a new tech comes out, you have your early adopters, mm -hmm. the people so what and there's like certain percent that no, no matter what they do, like like even this 2024, they're still riding horses. They, they haven't adopted cars yet. The yeah, lag, the Amish, right? Yeah, the Amish had the lag. Like what's if what's that thing called? I can't remember the name of it. The what? They had the name for that, like the early adopters. The um, I think it's early adopters. Is that what it is? Yeah, okay. the more I mean, the the crossing the chasm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a long. Because like I think thirty three percent are like were never, like a high percentage would never adopt it until like the very last moment, whatever. Yeah, that's that's the technological like, you know, they say the nerds adopt it first, they, you know, and then it sort of propagates to, you know, the the fatter tail, and long tail. Yeah, so let's change, we're gonna come back to this and maybe change subjects. Like, what what are some of your hobbies? What do you do for fun? So, um, you know. I mean, most of my hobby is just, uh, you know, I, my mission is mis mis you know, mental and physical transformation and wisdom acquisition and building MVP to you know, over 1 billion a year. Um, so I'm, I'm either working out, uh, martial arts, uh, reading, a, listening to a ton of podcasts on, on uh, you know, regarding technology, reading a lot of books. Um, I throw like a lot of, you know, happy hours, so I am pretty social, but most of my free time is either you know, physical activity, you know, going to the gym, um, doing martial arts, uh, li or, or listening to a lot of, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I walk at least 10, 10 K steps a day. With my dog, like I, and I have so much podcasts that. Yeah. I remember one time I hung out with you one time and it was you, I think Greg, I think, and you were like, and you're like, let's go to this other bar. I said, we're gonna catch you. But no, it's, it's just around the corner, like, like 20,000 miles later. Yeah. Like, God damn, Ken. Yeah. What the fuck are you doing to me? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think my average step count is like twelve thousand. Yeah, and that's that's in addition to like going to the gym. Yeah, at uh, you definitely look more fit since the last time I seen you. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it was actually cut down alcohol significantly. Yeah, so yeah. you definitely look more fit. Yeah. Um, so what's something that you want to learn that you don't you don't know yet? Oh man, um, I want to learn a lot of things. Uh. I mean, I've always actually wanted to learn how to code, you know, and I, I remember just taking a few classes, um, but I, I think that's not a high priority right now. I think right now what I'm, you know, my, my goal is, you know, level up in my, the martial arts stuff I'm doing. So 
I want to learn more more skills in that area. How long have you been doing martial arts? Um, just recently, like January. Okay. So, and is it like you doing like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? It's like Krav Maga. It's like a combination okay. of okay. Boxing. And you do this every day or yeah, once a week? Uh, five days a week. Okay. I went this morning. Okay. Nice. Um. So talk about this like. What, what was the job you was, you had a job in the past, right? You're doing this job and you're like, you know what? I'm pretty fucking good at this, right? I might do this as my life, life's work, right? What was that moment, you know, period job or like you, whatever it was, you're like, you know what? I'm pretty good at this. Like, I'm damn good at this, right? And I, yeah. I, might, I might be able to make a lot of money and have a really successful life doing this. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm doing now, right? I, you know, you know, as I'm a part, you know, my, as a hobby, I run MVP, which is just an investment advisory company and you know, I love it. It's not even work for me, right? Looking at um, you know, learning about founders' journeys and uh, making investments. So that's something like what Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett are my heroes. Um, rest in peace, Charlie Munger. So I'm going to be running MVP for 110, 120, you know, as long as I can live. They scoot up this a little bit. I, I I'm gonna be yeah I'm gonna be doing running MVP for, you know until and I. How long? I, what year did you start that? Is that a recent adventure of yours or doing it for a while? I started uh, in, in 2014. Okay. So and then definitely accelerated through the uh, through the past. And what made you want to get to get involved in investing? Um, actually, that's interesting. So my, my it, what, I don't know if you, I told you the story, but my my grandfather was actually the first, technically the first corporate investor in Phil Knight Nike in 1972, when they're doing million dollars of revenue, and um, you know there's pictures of them on my LinkedIn. But I just remember you know telling my grandfather, I was like, man, if you actually get an angel check and invest in Phil, you know, it'd be like a billion dollars or whatever, right? And it was again as a corporate investment. And uh, so I, I always thought like, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great to, you know, be able to back, um, you know, founders early before they build a hundred billion dollar company. Something, somehow that kind of stuck with me, that, that, that desire. Um, and so um, I, when I uh, met a very successful angel investor in Maui at the Andas Hotel, like one of my, this backs very, one of my good friends, uh, Amit Gupta, who I met in San Francisco, uh, well, I'm also an investor in. Um, you know, I would. I, I went to one of his weddings. I went to his not one of the his his wedding in, in at the Andas Hotel in Maui. If you haven't been there, it's probably one of the most beautiful properties. Um, and I'm and there I met uh, a gentleman called Paige Craig, who's probably one of the most successful angel investors on the planet. And uh, you know, he invited me to invest at, uh, with him, and so I wrote my first check. It was like a 10K check. I remember when he first said, would you like to be an angel investor? I said, you know, I don't have enough liquid or I don't think I can financially do it. And you know, he mentioned you know, 10K. So that's something I could have, I could do. And that's got me off to down this rabbit hole and I've done over a couple hundred, right? So you've been with actually like, you, you actually worked with five previous startups. Mm -hmm. How has your like previous startup experiences helped you figure out what to invest in? Yeah, that's actually been a great uh, data um, source to really hone um, my decision process. You know, in terms of like, you know, identifying like characters of a good CEO or founder, um, you know, identifying like where there's potential product market fit, really understanding like, you know, how they go to market and brand because, you know, for a startup company, right, it's, you know, they're very resource constrained. So, you know, not only do you have to have a, a great, you know, technology product, like how do people even find out about it, right? So you're really trying to understand like how you know, they can solve those two, uh, you know, execute, you know, based on like you know, finding product market fit. So it's definitely, um, uh, you know, help in my decision-making process. So when, when, when founders like pitch or whatever, what's, I would say a red flag, what's something that like, causes you concern? Like, is it like they have every, everything good, but like maybe the business model is not right, or maybe they don't, they don't know the financials, or they're like, they're nowhere on social media. Like, what could cause concern when you talk to a So, founders? yeah. So, um, 
it depends on how early you're investing. If it's pre-CC, which most of my investments are, like there's basically no revenue. So, you know, it's easier if you're in private equity or doing series B, C, D, you have numbers to work with, right? Numbers are like the language of God, right? Or business, it's like the most important data point that you can really uh, do very deep due diligence. Um, and obviously you're gonna be paying a much higher price for them. But um, I, I use a simple like, a uh, couple frameworks, right? One is like, why are you the best person in the world to solve this problem? And do you find people have trouble answering that question? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of times if they can't really answer it with- And you think that's because like, they're like too humble or something like that, or like they really- They, they, they don't really have, they, can, they can't really the justify answer. why they're the best person in the world to solve okay. the problem. I think, you know, a lot, you know, I think uh, entrepreneurship is, um, it's like people want to be rock stars, right? It's like people want to be entrepreneur. And I think, uh, Peter Thiel mentioned this, right? And so, um, and it's very glamorous to say, hey, you know, I'm a founder and CEO of a company. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people who are going for it, which, which is amazing. But entrepreneurship is extremely, like, difficult, right? I think 90%, over 90% of startups fail. These are venture I mean, startups. Fuck it sucks. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. not unicorns and rainbows, right? It's yeah, like yeah. It's, it's, and so I have, but I have nothing but amazing, um, you know, respect and admiration for people who are, who are, uh, you know, are going for this epic hero's journey, right? Um, but yeah, and so, you know, back to your, back to your, like, how do I, the framework of analyzing, you know, the founder. And I, I learned this from Paige Craig as well, as I use the vice framework, like vision, intelligence, character, and execution, right? So I try to rate them on that, on those areas, like, you know, what's the vision they have you know, for this company in five to 10 years. And so when you invest in like this for like January 1st, 2025, on the day, are you going to say to yourself, okay, I want to like listen to a thousand pitches of those thousand pitches. I want to meet a hundred founders, those hundred founders. I want to do a deep dive in 10 founders and then maybe invest out of five of those thousand. Do you have metrics like that? Or is this like something different? No, I, I mean, I just, uh, I get sent a lot of deal flow. I also get uh, a lot of inbound from, from LinkedIn. So I try to look at every single one of them. Um, you know, I, I can usually decide in, in a few seconds if this is an area that, that I would be interested in. Uh, learning more. I mean, I, so the, the investment that I do is very niche, right? Like they have to be highly technical founders. And another test is like, can they make a million dollars or half a million dollars working at, you know, mega tech, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to be extremely talented, you know, a technical founder. And then they're going on this hero's journey and taking no salary or taking a very, very big pay cut. So they have to be very strong technical talent, uh, technical founding team is one of it in addition to like, you know, why are you the best person in the world to solve this? So I don't know if you see this meme, it was on LinkedIn a couple weeks ago. And it, it was like, it was a joke of course that I kind of shown how investors are going too far AI. So two people want to get, try to win the same investment firm, try to get an investment, right? One founder team, we've carried cancer. We're not interested. The next founder team came on. We want to do a food truck based on AI. Here's $10 million, but we don't know how, we don't know anything about AI. Here's 10 more million dollars, learn about it, right? So do you think the, the, the spectrum is going too far as far as AI investment? I no, I don't think sophisticated investors, you know. Of course, like, that is a joke, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's a total joke. I mean, at one time, like anything AI seems like people are throwing, you know, on their whole pitch deck or they put the AI and then when you peel the onion, they're just, you know, basically, you know, they have an API from OpenAI, which is yeah. fine as part of their. But you know, AI companies they're not, do that. You know, when you, when you say they're AI, it's like, what, you know, you know, are you, you know, what type of, um, you know, AI, again, the, the mode for AI is data. So a lot of times, you know, easy way to do diligence, like is, so, you know, your AI company, so what type of proprietary data do you have that you're able to train and fine tune those models, right? And so, and if they give you blank space, then they're not doing AI, blank, uh, blank uh, stare. So, um, you know, and when I do uh, due diligence uh, with these people, I bring one of the smartest people that I know in AI to help me with due diligence, you know, um, and so, because I'm not deeply technical, but again, that's just a you know side side gig, and um, you know right now I'm full time I'm director of AI ML business model for Scientific, so that takes majority of my time. So what does that company do? So you know it, that's very similar to what Scale AI does. You know we do a lot of um, for the LM space, we do a lot of you know red teaming, prompt authoring responses. We basically help deploy the LLMs safely, so the so the biggest problem for LLM is, is 
what they call hallucination, right? So hallucination is basically a fancy word for they talk shit or they lie a lot, right? They just they they basically uh, will output um, incorrect uh, answers or output. So you know if you want to move that to production, right? You want to ensure that you get as less hallucination as possible. So you know our company does a lot of um, uh, you know what we call RLHF resource learning reinforcement learning human feedback uh you know for for companies like amazon microsoft yes uh, we also have a very large engineering group where we can build custom models computer vision models logistic models um so can you give us like a i don't know if this is an answer to this but is there can you give like a simple definition of ai ml and language learning models is there such thing as a simple definition of like the average layman who knows nothing about tech I mean, AI, like I always like to say, AI just simply compute. You know, is 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 uh, data and computation. And if you kind of think about AI, it, it's just simply a a prediction engine, right? Model, right? And so that's where data comes in, right? If you have shitty data, you're gonna have shitty predictions. It's like, and so if you have good data, you have good, you know, you have good output, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, AI is just simply data, and then compute. But the quality of the AI is depending on the quality of the data. So, um, I mean, a good way to put it, I mean, and then, but, you know, I'm sure there's probably a much better answer, but I think I always like to say AI is simply data and compute. And so if you really want to make AI work, you better have a lot of good data. And so LMs are large language, right? Which are just, uh, in the past two, three years, it's just, blew up thanks to you know chat gpt two or three and or two that came out and uh you know what open ai did was like they you know they basically scraped the whole internet right and you know they, they use that as training data that's why they call it large language models yeah. made a very brilliant ui and brilliant engineers to with the advent of transformers that help to uh you know, create this amazing new uh tool so and right now there's a big arms race right not not that we have open AI, we have anthropic over here falcon you have open source so you know there's a lot of uh discussions around what are the true modes right for for these llms and is it just a big bubble um and yeah i, I do believe that within a bubble there's always going to be some interesting winners just like amazon and other companies so for like open AI, there's open AI, Claude, Gemini, all these things out there. Does the one someone use really matter? Are they, are they basically doing the same thing? Or is there advantage to using one versus another? Or are they basically the same? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the use case, right? I mean, you know, every week it seems like people come out saying our model is higher quality based on these benchmarks. And so, um, you know, Google, you know, you know, with the Gemini, um, but OpenAI definitely has a, a big lead. And again, it depends on the, the use case. I, I I I feel and some other of my smart friends feel like open source will probably win. But again, there's it's a big market. There's gonna be certain winners depending on the use cases. Um but yeah, I mean we're so early days and you know, a lot of you know, a lot of other even smart investors are just looking at this crazy investment um to them a bubble, right? For, for these LLMs and they don't think there's a sustainable, you know, long-term moat or business model around it. But again, time will tell. Um, you know, one you know one can argue that the unit economics is is sort of effed up when it comes to like, you know, when you have twenty dollars a user, right, that they're paying for, but the compute cost is actually very expensive. So, but again, you know, compute costs are coming down, models are getting smaller. Um, yeah, it's still early, early in this. Wild, wild west of the LLM, so. Yes, so let's suppose someone graduated high school 20 years ago, they barely graduated, like barely graduated. Last 20 years, they've had like menial jobs, like construction workers, or maybe a low level executive assistant, right? And, but now they won't get involved in AI, and, robot, and like and machine learning, right? Is it too late for them? Or is it just matter they have to go back to school and learn the skills? Like how do they get, get involved? Or how do they learn this? Or is it past their time, so to speak? No, I think, I mean, with the internet and YouTube, and I mean, a lot of the great universities uh, Stanford, MIT, you can take free courses uh, and learn as much as you want for free. And I think, I think Naval said this, like, 
the the desire to learn is actually the the, the biggest bottleneck. And so, if you really want to learn anything, you know, you can you have access to it through your phone and through the internet. So it's not too late at all. I mean, a lot of it is like, are you motivated to sit your butt down and yeah. not drink beer and play games, watch sports all day, and actually like learn, you know, more about AIML. There's so much resources out there. So it's not too late at all. In fact, you have the desire yeah. to learn anything you want. So back to simulation theory real fast, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this theory, right? So like, you know how like below us, like there's ants, bees, all these, like all uh -huh. the channels of life. In my mind, so two things I think, right? So I think there's like, we're like kind of above ants and bees, you know? Did you, oh, matter of fact, you see that thing on the news like a couple weeks ago where they found this like millions of miles of ant colonies and these ant colonies are like, you know, farms that like storage and stuff. And they ask the people like, how does it happen? And when they have like, on they smart? Oh no, it's just instinct. I'm like, how the fuck is this instinct, right? Yeah. Like, they, no. It's incredible actually, yeah. Um, like Daniel how, Dennett how was, instinct? Yeah, I mean, if you see someone like the ant, um, the castles they build, like, yeah. you know, they had a pick, I think Daniel Dennett, who I really listened to a lot back in the day, like showed like an ant colony castle and like some- Yeah, all that stuff. Amazing. There's nowhere that's uh, instinct. Italian. I mean, I mean, what is instinct? I mean, I think it's I mean, genetically I'll, like, yeah. you know, uh, through evolution and everything, just literally programmed in their DNA. I mean, you could argue, you know, the average person wakes up in the morning, brushes their teeth, eats breakfast, mm -hmm. drives 20 minutes to work, Works eight hours, come back. You could argue that's the instinct. I think you know they're doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, I mean, most of our human activity is like, you know, habits and. I mean, that's just where, you know, I I study a lot of neuroscience, and uh, you know, on my free time, that's another passion of mine. I, 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 um, and then that's where that rabbit hole of do we really have free will came in, and I spend you know. During the pandemic, I was literally listening to every, you know, podcast on free will and neuroscience and, you know, Robert Sapolsky, check him out, a brilliant Stanford neuroscientist. Um, uh, Sam Harris, I, I really like Sam Harris as well. He's the one that really made me, you know, he has a really good episode on free will. So one can argue that we don't have much free will. Like it's, we're literally... You know, I, I define free will as nature and nurture, right? Nature is your genetic. They can't, so this is something you can talk about for like five, 10 minutes, right? I can talk about this forever. All right. So I actually have to go to the bathroom. Okay, go ahead. So I'm going to have you just like, do talk about what you want to, right? Yeah. And that's your camera. Do you want to talk to the camera? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, what, are we still live or? Yeah. No, I'm not going to talk to myself. I'll just wait for you. Okay. All right. Okay. I mean, you can talk <laughs> just for people watching. Uh, it's fine. I'm okay. going to grab right. another NA beer. Okay. Yeah, that beer just ran through me. <laughs> good beer, huh? I love it. It's really good, yeah. It's also really good for hydration. Yeah, so back to free will. Yeah. It also depends on how you define free will, but, you know, back to your, like, you know, uh, story about how ants and how that instinct, and again, you know, there's, there's arg arguments that, that, uh, you know, they, they're just basically programmed, right, to do that through evolution. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you ever thought deeply about do we have free will? Yeah, um, yeah. And so a lot of it is how you define free will.
right? And so, but then I have a, there's another guy named Donald Hoffman who I really got into. Um, and so, you know, that consciousness is fundamental. So I, I have two very opposite, uh, you know, theories that I, I hold on to loosely, right? Where, you know, I believe, sometimes I believe we don't have free will, sometimes I, you know, that consciousness is everything. So this whole conscious experience we have is, you know, is all there is. So we, we have free will. And then the, the big picture is like, it doesn't matter if we have free will, right? Because our whole society and how we live is like, we have to live like it. Yeah, I know like some like religions, like Christianity, there's like the Baptist cats or whatever. I know some, I, I, I can't think of it's Methodist or Lutheran, one of them, they're like everything's predetermined, right? So before you're born, it's predetermined you're going to hell or whatever, right? So I, I just think it's predetermined. Why does it matter what I do, right? Yeah. Because that's, that's it's predetermined I'm going to hell. Why waste my life doing good stuff, right? I'm going to hell anywhere, right? And vice versa, you know? Yeah. But then why would, why would you know if you have, unless somebody yeah. told you up front, right? I know, yeah. Um, and then what's this concept of hell? I, like, I don't really. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, free will for me is this, is nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. Nature is like your genetics, right? And, um, you know, people are born with different talents, right? Athletics. Um, like I, I love athletics, but I was born with very poor, like athletic genes. I can never be a professional uh, football player or basketball player. Or, you know, some people are just genetically gifted, right? Whether it's like singing and, art and math and sciences, right? Like Einstein and, you know, these, these people were genetically, you know, gifted. And then there's also a big nurture part. You don't choose, and nature part is also, you don't choose your parents or anything. Right? Nurture is like where you grow up, right? You don't really choose that either. So do you really have much free will? And Sam Harris goes into that deeply. That made me really think about this concept of free will. And then, you know, Robert Sapolsky goes even deeper as a, neuro, you know, a neuroscientist in terms of, you know, inputs and outputs and how everything is like and then with scans you'll know exactly what you do before you're conscious and like, there's a lot of really interesting neuroscience around it but uh, but fundamentally i do believe that i have free will because i think that our conscious experience is everything so but it's it's interesting for me because even when i evaluate founders right i i look deeply into their their past mm -hmm. right like, their nature and nurture mm -hmm. to find out why they are what you know who they are so that kind of gives me a good understanding of the character, right? That they so, have. If, so if a founder had like had to overcome an obstacle, like maybe being born from a single parent household, maybe had to work through a college, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever that obstacle is, do that does that give them advantage? Yeah, mind? I I mean that grit and uh, is is actually the, one of the most important traits that you know I look for is that ability to overcome extreme hardships. And if actually if you look at like a lot of most a lot of talented entrepreneurs, they, they did come from a lot of uh, hardships. You know, they have that chip on their shoulder, right? Where they want to prove to the world that, you know, that, that they are somebody. Um, and that's a really good trait to have. Um, and so, because it takes so much drive to, you know, find, found a, a venture scale business. So you need that crazy grit. Yes. Yes. So, so back to my theory, right? Like I said, I think we're, we're like above ants, bees, all these like different things, right? But mm -hmm. I think there's something above us, right? I think there's something above us that looks down on us like we're the bees or, or yeah. ants, right? Well, if that is a god or some kind of AI alien someday. race or <laughs> the simulation, I think, I think there's something above us like yeah, that... looking down on us. What it is, I have no idea. I'm not smart enough to know that, but I think there's like something like, like just like, you know, suppose there's an ant colony somewhere and once in a while somebody pour some water on it, once in a while somebody like, you know, walk through it and yeah. like, mess it all up. I think like that's like a this is really going to wrap it up. I think like when we have like tornadoes and hurricanes, that's like someone above us like kind of stepping on our ant hole, ant hill, so to speak, you know. Yeah, and that's what that's the fear of AI, right? That AI is gonna get so smart we're gonna be like monkeys, you know, apes, um, in terms of like the level of intelligence. Um, you know, which, you know, again can happen in a certain, you know, function and domain. Um but uh yeah, I mean I mean, at this right now, currently, I think human species, Homo sapiens, you know, we're definitely the, you know, in terms of like a neuron complexity. And I mean, we're definitely the number one on this planet, right? I don't think there's a, I can't think of anything that is above human species in terms of like. Um, now, can like, like other animals like destroy us on a one on one battle? If we have no weapons. Yeah, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. Like, I don't want to go against a grizzly bear without this by my 
fair skin, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how you, you know, you know what you're. Well, as far as like being the number one predator, yeah, I don't think it's going close. Yeah, but again, that's the fear of AI, right? Because AI, um, and that's why there's a lot of, um, you know, fear around that AI without having the right guardrails or having the right regulation that it will, uh, it'll be much smarter as smarter than us human species and so, cause a lot of damage. In the past, there was like different, like there was like the Tenderon man, all these different forms of humanity, right? Like, like Homo sapien, whatever we call it, like different things. Yeah. Do you think we're about to be a, a different, like, like a different type of human, right? Like, yeah, cyborg. Yeah. Cyborg, like yeah, you know, we maybe are. human Looking AI or something like that. You know, think that's coming? It's already here. I mean, like, you know. I mean, you're we're, we're literally with this, we're a cyborg. It's a very low bandwidth connection. I mean, Elon would say this a few times. Um, Neuralink is quite revolutionary, right? I mean, you know, I, I have a buddy I work at the gym. Um, he has like a full on bionic knee, right? So like, you know, you know I, forgot, is, I forgot about the $6 million man back in the day. Yeah. I mean, so we are literally, you know, human machine cyborgs, and especially, you know, with this crazy supercomputer, um, having access to it. Right. I mean, we, I can't live without this phone. I mean, Google maps, you can run your business on it. You do everything. With right. It. So we are literally, you know, um, cyborgs already. So, and then with Neuralink, I mean, are you, are you doing that? Putting the Neuralink in your head? Not right now, but <laughs> I mean, when, when, you know, I'll probably consider it when it's, you know, when there's, enough, when, when there's enough data, right? Yeah. I don't think another For point, safety and things like that. Yeah. But. I don't think people realize how much power is on smartphones, right? I think I remember reading somewhere like there's more power on a smartphone than all the computer power that sent us the moon back yeah. in the 60s, right? Which is totally insane, I think. Yeah, it is pretty insane. I mean, it just shows you the exponential curve that we're on for. And what's that saying? I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to fuck this up, but. Um, we used to think la lack of access to information had made people stupid. Now we realize it wasn't that, you know, we have access to information all there. Yeah. And people are still stupid, you know, so to speak, you know. Yeah, that's a very interesting. Um, I remember reading about that and uh, like, yeah, I mean, I, I would think that with the access to all this information, the key is like with a lot of information, there's a lot of shitty or bad information, right? So yeah. again, like I look at myself like as machine learning model, right? It's like we're basically our, our whole algorithms or how we, you know, view the world is based upon the information that we die, ingest, right, and that we believe in. So, if you're out there reading all about QAnon and whatever, you're gonna have be you're gonna be extremely like, and the algorithm is gonna put that stuff back in front of you. Yeah, and then yeah, with all the relevance uh, machine learning models out there, like if you you know if you're engaging with this specific content, they're gonna feed you more of that because they want to sell ads, right? And so, um. And so it just perpetuate the, you know, the bias that you have for that specific belief, which is scary. Um, and um, I mean, that's, that's the whole issue right now in, in this country, right? The, you know, with, with uh, this crazy, like, um, fighting among, you know, Republicans, Democrats. I mean, I feel like we should all just unite and for, you know, citizens of United States of America and but we have this crazy you know uh I mean some people say Ray Dell I think it might be civil war I mean this is that's I mean fucking crazy yeah like how and I, I mean, how do we, I don't know what we have Trump like, Biden again right like how I mean like that's fucking insane like, yeah I mean we live in a fucking simulation then if you think about how insane this world is right now um I think this is I've read a stat like 75 percent of, of, of Democrats don't want Biden 72 percent of Republicans don't want Trump, but here we are. Like at least, like to me, both those Democrats. Did you, did you really get seventy-two percent Republicans don't want Trump? I, you know, yeah. I, but they have no other choice, yeah. right? Wait, JFK is running as a Republican. RFK, RFK, yeah, RFK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like him. I listened yeah. a few times. I mean, um, I don't really follow Paul. Again, most of my time, I'm either working out or listening yeah. to neuroscience, but, but it matters, podcasts, right? I mean, or I mean, yeah, I I try not to go to that. I know someday I will. It's just not on my um, priority list. Like, uh, you know. Yeah, I got more important things to do. Um, so let's talk about, I'm going to say this word wrong, like philosophy. I think it's, it's stoicism. Uh, stoicism. Stoicism. Like, I know, uh, uh, from, I was like, what's Marcus name? Aurelius. Yeah, him. yeah, he's a big one. He's like, isn't he the biggest one? I, I mean, there's yeah, there's there's a couple others. Oh my gosh, I forgot the names. Um, Ryan Holiday, I, I bought a few of his books. If you really want to get a really quick intro on stoicism, um, 
So I, I really like reading some of Ryan Holiday stuff, like Memento Mori. You know, I really like that concept. Of, yeah. Remember, you'll die. It's like the yeah. skull. Um, Mori Fati, like embrace fate, everything that happens in life. It's just, you know, just having a view in life that, you know, um, just being resilient and, and uh, doing what you can to, you know, that's in your control. Uh, being conscious of death is one. Um, it's just, like for me, I really, that some of Marcus Reyes' all that stuff resonated with me. So Isn't it great? Like he was alive what? Like, what? thousand years ago maybe i mean yeah a long time ago and i, I don't know and, and, yeah. I, and we're still like you know i won't say falling with his like words and deeds but people like still like meditate on him and like really like live it as a lifestyle right yeah because he, he wrote meditations good. and it was a really you know because he wrote that book down and became a philosopher um and a lot of the stuff he shared was you know, very helpful for me yeah so how do you learn from other people what's your method for like learning from people I mean, there's multimodal ways of learning from people, right? Face to face, like this, books, podcasts. I mean, it's just information and data. So I, you know, I'm, 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 I listen to, like, I'm reading an audio book right now. Or I'm listening to an audio book. I meet people face to face and, you know, get the, the whole multimodal. So um, you can learn many different ways, right? Like, uh, I haven't been reading paper books as much. Uh, I seem to be more like, I like to walk and listen to, so that's, that's that's how you learn best right now. I I think so. I like it, and some people don't like it. Like I love going on long walks or hikes with the audio. Um, going to you know Elliott Bay Water, or going to Madrona Beach. Um, just you know listening to an audio book or podcast. I feel like I really ingest the information well as I move my body. Um, you know, versus like sitting down, I get yeah. really antsy because I'm super high energy. Yeah, and, you know, pretty ADHD like. <laughs> I was actually diagnosed with ADHD in college, so I, I you know, there's a, some pretty, um, but again, if I can hyper focus, if there's like something really interesting, yes, I, I seem to learn best when I'm like on, moving on, around, on. walking around. Okay, that's good. Um, so AI and ethics, right? Of course, a lot of people are worried about AI ethics, right? Is there a way? Of course, my, my thing is like whoever like does the AI, right? How do we make sure they're ethically like you know doing the right thing ethically, right? How do you make sure the people coding the AI, whatever, like they they're doing the best mm -hmm. things? Because I mean, like I know like things that these like HR tech recruiting AIs are coming out, mm -hmm. being sure to have bias, you know. I'm making this up. I think it's like some kind of a facial recognition for police department. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't include any African Americans in there. So it was all biased against African Americans, right? Like I mean, is there a way to prevent this or just yeah. like the cost of the business? And that's what you know? yeah, I mean it's hard because bias can be uh subjective, right? But that's a data problem. And so the way to cure data is to have enough of enough representation of that data that you feel is you know, where it's causing bias and feeding that model so it can, you know, it can, it can uh, solve that. So um, that's where this whole responsible AI, safe AI, it's just data, like you, having enough data to be able to, um, you know, solve those you know, bias issues. And that's, again, AI is just simply data and computation. You have bad, shitty data and it just, it's an inference engine, right? So it's better data, better prediction, you know, you know, higher quality, bad data or missing data, you're going to have for results, right? You can also miss some demographics that are not represented because the data is not there. So it's just data. You just need to collect, you know, data. Uh, and again, it's whoever is, you know, uh, again, biases can be subjective too sometimes, right? So that's another difficult. Is there some kind of like international AI ethics organization out there somewhere that's like overseeing all this stuff and say, hey, I don't know. AI, and I don't, I don't know AI. if I want them. Like, why do you want these people who don't understand AI? Like some government, like, like, I don't really believe we should regulate AI, right? Like, um, you know, there's a big right now debate thing, AI should be regulated, but I think that's going to hinder competition. You're going to have other countries like China and India and everybody who doesn't have less restrictions to, to continue to innovate. Like regulation is done by these, I don't know, people who don't understand AI and the government. Like, who I mean, are these guys who... Yeah. Give us these Perfect cargo. example when uh, I was sure you seen it with the, like the TikTok president with uh, testifying of Congress. They're like these old ass men had no clue what they're asking, right? And this makes sense. I don't think, man, you should ask your intern what to ask, right? Yeah, so I mean was, that's why so these guys are making who the I mean like it was so embarrassing. I, yeah, I'm I'm so against that. I mean, you know, so Elon and all these guys signed things about I forgot what they signed. So maybe you know I, I see that they want to sort of collaborate and you know build some type of a. And I believe in that, 
but in terms of like government regulation, I mean, I, I do believe that, you know, there should be like standards and people, leaders in AI getting together and collaborating for the greater good, right? And so I think, you know, Microsoft, OP, they're all trying to do that, I think. Um, so. Is is US and China the two big players in AI or are there like other countries like in the competition with us as far as moving AI forward? I mean, this, I, like, I mean, right now, I mean, US has always been the lead in China, US, China, India from a, in terms of, um, probably our, our top three, and I could be wrong. I don't really, I haven't looked at the data. So one thing I realize is that, you know, I look at the data and most of the stuff say, if I, you know, I'll change my mind anytime, any day, I just look at the data. But yeah, it just seems that US is a lead. China is like up there with us, given that their massive investment in in AI and just the, the brain power they have, they have over 1.4 billion people and the brilliant, a lot of brilliant STEM scientists come, right? Same, same as India. So when you have the talent and the investment, you know, you're going to have a lot of innovation. So I think those three countries, but U.S. is by far right now, I think in the lead. Um, but, you know, China could be blow past us on certain areas. Basically. Is there a country out there that like no one knows about that's doing big things in AI, like maybe Ecuador or like, very great, like, like kind of. I, I have no idea. Country. I mean, there could be, right? I know um, the Middle East with all the money, they're they're recruiting a lot of the top research scientists to go out and, and, and go out there, pay them a lot of money to really, you know, with unlimited oil money, right? Um, but again, it's the the massive scale of talent we have in the U.S. and the capital from venture and whatever is unmatched here. So, I'm sure there are, um, but nothing compared to the U.S. But again. I haven't really looked at all the data. So why do you think Seattle has become like one of the, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming this is correct. Why Seattle has become like one of the leading AI hubs? Well, it's simple. I mean, talent here, Amazon, Microsoft, they have a lot of great engineers, but it's not the top. I mean, the top is still by far Bay area, um, you know, because a lot of it is just the, the there isn't much venture funding in Seattle compared to, but, but yeah, Seattle is definitely have uh, you know a lot more investment and a lot more innovations happening in AI, but it's nothing compared to the Bay Area yet. Um, but Seattle is hot because of the talent. I mean, so many brilliant engineers and scientists from at Amazon, Microsoft, Meta. You know, they're all they're all moving out here. So and then they they're the ones that decide they want to embark on their startup journey and starting an AI company. And they were continued to do that. Um, so. But they're going to be, we're still going to be far, far, far behind the area given the, the capital support. And so, so I think we're, there's a AI, Seattle AI week next month, right? Yeah. Are you involved with any kind of way or? Yeah, I think I'm sponsor, helping to sponsor a couple events. Okay. Um, there's CVPR coming up in June, which is computer vision pattern recognition that we're. Is this the first sponsor. Seattle AI week or they did this last year too? I deep, I, they did it last year. They did. Okay. All right. This is sponsored by like you know, Madrona and AI2. And so it's based like a startup Seattle week sort, but it's just yeah. AI. Okay. And, you know, a lot of sponsored by a lot of the, the, uh, you know, Pioneer Square, like a lot of the VCs and venture companies out here. Yeah. So with investing in Seattle, right? I know a lot of investors in Seattle get criticism. They don't, they don't invest so much. They don't have like funds, whatever. I know like a lot of startup founders that go different places get funding versus Seattle. Uh -huh. Do you think anything can be done with bringing more capital or just, just the way it's been, it's always going to be like this and people got to maybe go to the Bay Area as part of their fundraising strategy versus getting money here? I mean, there are, uh, there's, Bay Area just by sheer scale is always going to have, in just the history, they're going to have large mega funds out there. I mean, a lot of them are actually opening up offices out here. So that's going to help where they have, partners that are scouting out talent here in Seattle. Um, and uh, I think, you know, m money is going to go where the talent and opportunity is. So as we turn churn out some more interesting uh, companies here in Seattle, like a lot of the, a lot of the funds will have, you know, a lot of the GPs will move out here, right? Tax reasons like that. So, um, but yeah, I think Seattle is definitely a very uh, promising place for AI. 
And for your own investments, is it like majority majority Seattle based companies? Like is it equal equally balanced across different places in the United it's States? Very little Seattle. Most of the it's like Y Combinator okay. companies based out of Bay and Register. So Most to, of my portfolio have been Y Combinator. And so you go to, demo day type you go, of you go, you go, you do, Most, do you do demo day in person? Yeah. So I have a I'm an LP in a few funds where they have people that bring me interesting deal flow and then I would, you know, invest with them. Um, but yeah, most of my portfolio have been more Y Combinator batches. And for the demo day at Y Combinator, like all these companies you already know about, like they maybe they pitched before, or it's like you walk into a demo day and it's the first time you've seen a pitch, you make a decision off the first time. I actually, there's a directory on, you know, all the Y Combinator batches and I look at each one of them. Okay. You know, time to see, not each one, but, and the, or people would bring me these interesting ones that mm -hmm. they feel are the most promising on the batches. And I would look at the, Deal memo, um, the pitch deck, and then maybe talk to John. Nice. Um, what's quantum mechanics? Is quantum mechanics and quantum computer the same thing? Or those two different things. Uh, I'm not a physicist, but they're two different. I mean, quantum okay. mechanics is, you know, um, I mean, quantum mechanics is fascinating, right? Because if you think about quantum mechanics, it gave us the transistor, and transistor gave us a computer and everything, right? But the quantum mechanics, nobody understands how it works. It's like literally. Like a electron can be a wave and a particle, like and and uh, nobody understands how it works. It's like literally shut up and calculate, right? It's like the Schrodinger equation. So um, there's a lot of spirituality involved in quantum mechanics, right? With all the law of attraction thing, you know that. So uh, it's a, but people take it too far. But I mean, quantum mechanics breakthrough gave us this whole technological revolution. It took us from cavemen to like these super, uh, you know, gave us all this super technology. So um, in, in quantum computing, it's still not a real thing in terms of running in production. Like it's still theory. Um, there's a lot of reasons why. I, I, again, I'm not a, uh, so I, I don't want to like, go, I don't want to be incorrect, but. I mean, quantum mechanics is basically gave us everything we have here, right? Yes. Um, and many, many other things. Like, again, I'm not a physicist, but it's just amazing uh, breakthroughs in our human species. If you look at the history of, like, how this whole technological, like, exponential curve went crazy, it's because of the founding people, you know, who, who, who uh, developed these interesting... Uh, algorithm, you know, inter interesting algorithms or functions and everything that works, even though they don't know why it works, it works. And it gives us this crazy world. <laughs> Here's one for you. So way, way back, mind blowing. In, way back in the day, everyone on Earth just knew it was, it was the only Earth and nothing else, right? Like we, the Earth revolved around the sun, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then later, that's disproven, right? So all the years, the smallest people in the world are proven to be wrong. Yeah. Right? So We're what, still, what do we know that without a doubt is true now that you think is going to be proven to be false? I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that's going to be, um, I mean, the only thing that came out was this free will concept, but again, that's going to shake up society too much. They're not going to really focus on it. Um, I don't think that we don't really have truly have free will, but it's going to help with like, when you go down the street and you see all these homeless people, like it's not their fault. Like they, they come from very difficult childhoods, you know, their neurons haven't developed because they didn't get the love and nurture, like people in prison, like you can do studies on them. Like a lot of them have, you know, trauma in the hardware that they, they had, you know, um, you know, a lot of people who murder people, like it's like, they can see the brain waves that, you know, they, they get, they're born with some type of a, uh, you know, hardware issue. So I think that will help us, you know, we look at these people as like, oh, you know, they're just lazy and they're drug addicts. And I think, with understanding of neuroscience, we'll have a lot more compassion and hopefully we'll change a lot of how we put people in prison. Like, I don't think we should put drug addicts in prison. I don't think we should put, um, and I mean, there should be some level of rehabilitation, but uh, I think that will be a big shift studying the science. So that, of it. And, uh, so and doing a lot of things to mitigate that initial risk, right? Would this be ethical to do or not? Like suppose like um, there's a bunch of kids born, right? And genetically, they say, okay, this kid is going to be 
predetermined to do this. This can be predetermined to like, you know, based on the genes, neuroscience, what effect be. Yeah. Predetermined to be homeless, right? It would be ethical going like change those genes around to make that person a more productive like matter CRISPR? of society. Yeah. I mean, so ethics is based upon one's own, like, you know, you know, uh, like ethics is sort of subjective, right? And so it also depends on what, what, you know, the reason for that. Um, I mean, if I knew like this person is going to be a serial killer and I can do a CRISPR to take that gene out of aggression, like I would, you know, it seems quite ethical to do that. So um, I, I don't know. It's, it's case by case and it's, you know, I think it's going to depend on. And then who makes that decision, the human or the AI, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a whole area that another rabbit hole, right? Yeah, if we can go to a specific use case, maybe we can. I mean, what, what's the thing they always say? If you go back in time and kill Hitler as a baby, you know, would you do it? You know, a lot of people say yes, but then by killing Hitler, you change everything, right? Like, yeah, if you, if you have no idea what the outcome yeah, those are hypothetical. I don't like to really. Yeah, yeah, it's just one of those hypothetical where I can't really. You know, it's gonna. Depend on yeah, and then people talk, uh, people talk like time travel, like going back in time, or whatever. Like, but even you go back to change one little thing, all these timelines like diverge and change, right? Like, it's just to me, it's just close confusing, right? Even with the the the, the uh, adventures and moves, you know, back in time, right? For the fight down, it's like all the different timelines. To me, it's just too fucking confusing, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, why go through that? Because we don't. I mean, we don't know. I mean, it's not. It's it's a thought experiment that you can mm -hmm. go down many different paths. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, it's entertaining sometimes. Yeah. And then um, this is my thing too. Like, so were we able to see the Northern Lights last week? So I, did you see it? Yeah. So I was freaking out. I was actually with Greg and those guys at a, uh, we were at a, bar, a Sands bar. Yeah. I, so I thought that Northern Lights, like, I remember my friend went to see it, but I was like, um, oh, the chances are that it won't happen because Northern Lights, you don't know if it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I learned this in Alaska saying, you know, where, I went to this Aurora like museum and they're saying that people like camera people would spend like days or weeks trying to witness yeah. that Aurora. Right. So I was like, Oh, so, you know, I had a buddy that said to go up two and a half hours and, and uh, he saw a magnificent Aurora, right. Or neural lights. And I was like, wow. And then I, I found out the next day that there might be a showing. So I went out to uh, Edmund's water bar in that area and waited for like, Two, three hours until yeah. like 1 a.m nothing happened yeah so i didn't get to see it live i tried to see it on saturday mm -hmm. but you, you saw it yeah, yeah so how I, was it like it was great so like it was it was friday i heard it's coming right but i heard the yeah. next of the news we we'll probably be able to see it whatever like so i just actually i, I fell asleep early friday night yeah and, and next morning i wake up like all these pictures on facebook yeah like most of in texas colorado Florida. yeah and, and beautiful and beautiful picture and i was so pissed right and so that night i went with a friend, so I live in a town called DuPont, went to the golf course. Like a, That's a nice area, yeah. Movie, yeah. And so we stayed up, we didn't see the lights. Like we're out here anywhere to stay. Anywhere. So the, we didn't see, actually see the lights until the lights were out in DuPont like 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. We had to stay a long time, yeah. Wait, so you you didn't, you didn't see it, right, Saturday? Saturday, no, Sunday morning from 2 to 5 a.m. You saw it? Yeah. Okay, Sunday. was it pretty clear? Yeah. So it was 2 to 5, it did show up, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to sleep then. Yeah, yeah. And then so my point I was going to make, right, so like this is something we don't see all the time. What else is out there you want to see, right? Like what else is like, is there that we don't see, right? Because like you know, maybe there's not a solar flare or not magnetic storm, but do you think there's anything that we're not seeing, like from a nature like yeah. phenomenon perspective? Yeah. I mean, maybe. I mean, I think you know, given the propagation of the you know tech and this, like you know, I I think we are seeing. A lot of different things but again we only see certain light frequencies so mm -hmm. i'm sure we're missing a lot that yeah. butterflies and other species with different things they probably see way interesting things um because we're li limited by our hardware right yeah so but yeah i think we don't see anything we yeah. i mean we like our dogs can smell way more yeah. deeper like you know I, I heard like some other species like butterfly can see so many different or i don't know bats or whatever or you know other uh uh, animals, right? That uh, so there's a lot of things we don't see because of our limited uh, you know, hardware. Yeah. So you have this quote: um, "Wisdom acquisition is a moral duty." But is that by Munger? Yeah, Charlie Munger. Yeah, yeah, I, that really resonated with me. Um, so I that, I spend most of my time just trying to learn and try to be less ignorant uh, as possible. 
basically train my machine learning model to be more, you know, a little more accurate, right? And so that's why I read a lot. I, I ingest a lot of data. Um, so, you know, I can, um, you know, make better decisions because we have so much blind spots, you know, so much biases. And I think the problem out. is most people don't recognize that. They'd say, no, you know, they don't. I mean, so yeah. many people like, I know everything. Do you really? Like, yeah, like, that, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know shit. I don't know shit. That's 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 one thing I as more I learn, more I realize I don't know anything. But um, and the best you can do is, you know, uh, I mean, we don't really. And we're all, you know, we're all making decisions based on limited data. Uh, but um, and depending on what you're solving for, like it's fine, it works. But yeah, I agree. There's a lot of people moving around this world that I feel are not, you know, awakened, right? So maybe they need to do like a LSD yeah. or mushroom trip or something. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we need to talk about that too. I had a friend on the podcast one time. He made me laugh. Right? He he was like a I don't ever want to be the smartest person in the room, but I don't want to be the dumbest person in the room either. <laughs> I want to be the dumbest people in the room. I don't I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Like I always want to surround myself with the, so I can learn from them and and uh, you know I I think I always want to be the dumbest person in the room. Like you know I don't want to. But be the, the dumbest, person. dumbest, like the total yeah, dumbest. Sure. Yeah. Totally. I'd be yeah. super fine with that. I but, mean, in fact, uh, I, I, I would prefer you, that. But if you're the dumbest, how do you have, have any like um, reference points of, to what's being talked about? So you, I have mean, to, you have to have a little bit of knowledge, I would think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to. But again, you can learn, right? If, you have a, if, you, if you're in the smartest room in the area that, who are truly domain experts in that area, you just ingest a lot of information, right? And so you can actually you know, slowly um, get clarity around yeah. that topic. So yeah, I... I, I I would always want to be the dumbest person in, in that certain like area. Right? It depends on the use case, right? Yeah, like yeah. if I'm on Jeopardy or something, winning for a big prize, <laughs> like I want to be the smartest guy in the room, right? It's like or, or more precisely, yeah, the, the smartest person on those subjects on the board. Yeah, of course, like like, like, yeah, like, like I have something to win. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I like want if, if AI is not on the it board, depends. everything's yeah. all like 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 what's what's this exact situation, right? Like, so do you want to get a know. drink? Are you no? No, I'm just gonna drink. I think I got a lot to do today. All right, so uh, I I'm gonna you, have a birthday party tonight. All right, so this is embarrassed. I have to use the bathroom again. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. You want to show here? This beer? Yeah, this beer is probably running through me for yeah. some reason. It's right. the best, best beer. What are you up to today, later? Uh, podcasting, trying to convince people to sign up for Cabinet's HR, fundraising. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of stuff going on. We'll talk about it after this. Um, yeah, right on. Um, so for your schedule, right, how do you do your schedule? Like, you do like a blocks of time where you focus on one thing. You do like a four-hour four, four hour block. You do creative stuff, like 15-minute blocks. Mm -hmm. like, I'm pretty sure you don't wing it. Like, how do you, like, do that? Yeah, I try not to wing it, but I mean... I have so much room for improvement on that. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, I put priority for my 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 role at, at Scientific and you know, really block off a lot of time for that activity. And then on the evenings and weekends is when I, you know, focus on the other investment passions that I have. Can you talk about this? Like, there's people like you who are, like, doing a lot, right? You have a full-time job. You're doing martial arts, you know, you're you're married, so that's mm -hmm. obligations. You have a pretty good social life. You have friends you hang out with yeah. a while. You, you, there's a lot out there. What you're doing, and somehow it's not like you you're doing all it right. You have it kind of figured out right. And there's other people right who are like they work a nine to five job, basic job, and they can't control that right. They 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 can't do that do that right. Why do you think some people are able to like 
compartmentalize, do time management, focus, and others like can't. Is this like a gene people have, or is this like trained learning? Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the stuff I'm doing on the site is like not work for me. It's fun, right? Like, um, so you know, I'm sure those guys are prioritizing other things that are fun. That you know, you know, whether it's you know watching sports or you know watching Netflix or I don't do any of that stuff. Like I'm, I'm a no, I, I like to watch sports here and there, um, but I, I try to spend most, and I don't even like to watch like movies or rom com. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a boring husband sometimes because I, you know, I always want to watch documentaries or something <laughs> like on physics or something or neuroscience, you know, and my wife's like not interested, right? <laughs> so, and then when I try to watch a movie, you know, with her, like some, you know, show, like my, my brain just literally be like, oh my gosh, you're wasting your fucking time with this shit and then I, it's very negative but i get that and i don't know why it's not good i wish i can be like oh my gosh i want to be able to just enjoy this but i literally i get really antsy be like i don't know if i want to spend time watching this yeah i'm the same way. my wife watches tv shows I, yeah and I, I just yeah i just feel my brain cells dying but i make myself watch it with the once in a while because that's that's been time yeah and there's some i really got into um and so maybe i just need to like you know find a show that really uh, really, really grabs me, but um, but uh, yeah, I I just have so much to learn. Um, and I know those people who love fiction and fantasy, and and a lot of the smartest people I know. And I think that's an area that I really want to. You know, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of fantasy books, and uh, you know, I think it helps with the creativity and just um, so. But I just seem to be a guy that just loves nonfiction. Um, now, now your wife's a pretty like successful real estate agent, home right? Right. She's in the mortgage banking, mortgage and then bank, yeah. yeah, now she's a she's just opening up a, a a store in the Bellevue Square Mall. Okay, because well. she's killing it too, right? I'm sorry. So she's, she's killing she's killing her career too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's super busy as well. She's right now helping uh, with the opening. She's opening up a place in Bellevue Square Mall. So okay. Right now. Nice, nice. Um, pitches. So, do you want to talk about psychedelics a little bit? Uh, not really. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Um, so how many companies right now are in your portfolio? Like how many, like uh, a couple hundred, a couple hundred. Okay. Yeah. So how do you like keep track? Like, do they all give you like updates once a month, once a quarter? Like, uh, some do, some don't, um, are some, some don't for reasons of just like really keeping, um, uh, just, you know, uh, they're, they're really heads down on, on building and I'm not on the board or any very active, but and what's uh, like your average investment? Um, it depends. Were, like, you know, I just recently wrote a 350k check, but it was with me and a couple partners. Mm -hmm. Um, another couple hundred k we're gonna rent, but most of my individual check size is pretty small, like ten. Okay, all right. Um, you want to highlight any of these companies real fast? Like, talk about what they're doing. They're um, popular, sure. Right? They're doing the great things. Yeah, I mean, ones. the recent one is Exalinx Labs. Like, they're building sovereign space programs, uh, starting with the country of India and a few others. Um, just a, a brilliant team that was the founding team at Planet Labs, which launched, you know, 150 plus satellites into space. And there's a huge uh, space boom happening, uh, thanks to, you know, SpaceX and just the, you know, technological like innovation that's happening. So there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, LEO satellites in space with many different use cases, right? Whether it's high res, SAR. Internet to um, you know RF. There's so many different use cases, right? And so there's like this huge campaign explosion of, of of space. So I'm very excited about that. And a lot of times, like these sovereign nations, you know, they don't want to rely on a Maxar or Airbus for their satellite data because at the end, of data is what they want. And so a lot of these countries want to build their own sovereign space program. So this company that I back is doing that for nation states to build their own like satellite constellations and you know, help them manage that. So is this a startup that you invested in the past that I like, will say didn't make it right? You, of course you, you invest There's in tons. You, you, you yeah. invested in this one because you know it's gonna make it. Yeah. And for the reason they didn't make it, like what lessons do you learn about investing from this failed startup? I mean, you learn a lot and that's the reason why I think, um, you know, you, you know, hopefully, you know, you can be a good pattern matcher and seeing things, but again, you know, whatever worked in the past doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. Mm -hmm. Whatever failed, a lot of it's timing, right? Like, you know, um, like in terms of like, is the market ready? Is their ecosystem of technology ready? 
But for me, it's just fundamentally like it's the founding team because they may have to change their idea multiple times, right? And so you're basically backing uh, a highly technical team um, because if they're highly technical, you know, technology is great because it can help them scale and and uh, it can really be the X factor, right? When it comes to differentiation. So for me, again, I really look at the founding teams. Like, why are the bet? Why are the most, you know, um, why are the best founders to solve this problem? And also, I look for like back to my love for for neuroscience and biology. Like, you know, I'm looking for those freaks of nature, right? As they say, right? Just extremely uh, interesting DNA, right? Like, like from an intelligence perspective. And then the next part is look for crazy grit, like. The Kobe Bryant's, you know, I call it the no off switch, right? Like they're literally, they don't have an off switch. Like, and I think you need that type of obsessive um, uh, mentality to to build a venture scale business. But again, there are other areas where there's he's a multiple founder. They got the great team together, you know, founding team. They just, they know how to do it without the crazy work hours. But, um, but again, you know, I'm wrong more than I'm right. So, you know, it keeps you very humble. <laughs> being angel investors has anyone ever then, has anyone ever fooled you fooled you into making you think they were like like this type of founder and in reality they weren't oh yeah i mean all the time i mean they're, they're all pitching right so they're trying to sell you um and that's where you you know you, you you just start peeling the onion right in terms of the background um you also hit a lot of tennis balls and you see how consistently they can hit it back like do they change their story do they you know are they saying things that are a little bit not uh like if they start confusing you, that's when it's like a major red flag, like where they start using big words, um, <laughs> like AI, that's when it's like, you know, and then they can't really tell me why they're using AI. And, and that's like a huge red flag, right? Where they just basically are just throwing big buzzwords around to see if, to impress you, right? Yeah. Where they don't really understand what those buzzwords truly mean. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and then, you know what I'm saying? It's like a 10 to 15 year liquidity event. It's fucking like, like it's not, it's not like crypto where you can get rich quick on the right, you know, pump and dump, right? I mean, um, so well, these are long these are 10 to 15 people. year liquidity event, 10 to 15 year, if they make it. So it's not, it's not an asset class that, um, you know, is, is, uh, and it's a high risk asset class, right? So it, it's, it's not an area that, I advise people really get into unless they can do at least 20 bets. And then with the caveat is expect to lose all your money. Yeah. yeah. And then they have to have a passion for it. Like they need to really enjoy, you know, understanding and, and, uh, you know, for me as a most curious, um, you know, as a guy that's super curious, it's fun for me to sort of put the puzzle and the picture together, right. Of, of, of what they're trying to accomplish. Like it's for me, it's fun to learn about what they're trying to build. Like it's fun to learn about, you know, their, their vision and, and why they're doing this. Right. Um, so for me, again, it's not when he came back, he's like, why do you have all this time to do it? It's like, for me, it's play. Like instead of playing video games, I like to do this type of stuff. Right. So let's say you have a group of techno founders come to you, right? They're technical savvy. They're building a great product. Have you found yourself? You had like maybe like training or choosing how to do like the marketing stuff, like the social media, like put, build your brand instead of like been all in on product. Of course, product's important, but have you had a like, train of a coach someone like being like, yeah, putting yourself out there. Does anyone want this? You know, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's the most important part, right? Is um, if they haven't spoken to like, first is like, why are you the best person to solve this problem? Right. And then some, some people have been working on that specific problem for years, right? Like for example, I'm back in a founder that was a ex director of meta AI for digital marketing and then senior director of XPD. And he's been working on this for, years on this problem of leveraging AI for digital advertising. Um, in addition to that, he's done a bunch of like customer interviews, right? And so, you know, he has both. That's the reason why I, I'm very, you know, very convinced to, to support him is if you don't have that background of like that, you know, you're 22, you know, you're trying to go after this problem, you don't have deep domain expertise, but if you show that you spoke with 50, 100 of your ICPs, right? Uh, of your potential clients and and uh, you told them about what you want to build and they're like, yes, I want it and I'm willing to pay you for it, right? That is, you know, those are the signals we're looking for. It's like, have you spoken, have you validated that this is this is actually a problem? This is not a vitamin, but a, a, a pain, you know, a real pain that they want to actually 
take out money from their pockets and give you. So that's another one is like, how, how did you validate that there's demand for this? So they have to show you that they've actually spoken to 50 or 100, you know, potential clients. And let's suppose a founder comes to you and say, I've spoken to 100 people and they give you the stats. You, you then like maybe like, hey, can I have a couple of those numbers? You're like kind of verify that? You just yeah. press the okay. yeah, you, yeah, you want to go and maybe do reference checks. And a lot of okay. VCs do that, right? They really talk with like, It's all due diligence. Yeah, right? and that's the data room, right? Where they like even look at the LOI, letter of interest, and look at, you know, what is that actually, what's the wording on that? So they really do their due diligence of determining what's real and what's a little, you know, shenanigans, right? So a lot of people say like founders, they're going to pivot right based on different things. But is there such thing as a founder is pivoting too much? No, if they can get that other pivot right and hit part of market fit. I mean, okay. if, as long as they have enough runway, right? The, the biggest okay. problem is they don't have time to pivot. Yeah. They run out of cash. Um, but I mean, there are many situations where the initial vision, you know, they were spot on because, you know, they, they were, you know, the best founders in that space and they execute. I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many different narratives, right? And it's survivor bias. So it's really hard to, you know, every, I think everybody's journey is different. Um, and so, you know, um, that's where it comes to like finding founders with, you know, high grit and, you know, high intelligence is where they can pivot around and be able to, to, uh, you know, move to another, um, because, you know, I, I backed this brilliant founder, you know, late last year and I hated his idea. I fucking hated it, but I, I liked him so much that I just knew he's going to figure it out. I could be wrong, but like, I literally told him, I hate this idea. Like, I feel like everybody in the grandmother's doing this idea. It was an AI based idea. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, yeah. I, I'm not gonna say the name. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I just, in my, in my, in my, uh, I just feel like, and he was like a superstar, like he's built multiple companies, you know, best selling author in different technical domains. Um, and so, um, and so there, and it was a pre seed round. So there you're just betting on. Founder. I don't even think maybe he's going to execute on this initial idea that he has, he shared in the deck, but I have a strong feeling that he's going to completely find a different area to, to build on. And, uh, he's raised a significant amount of money. So he has runway. He has a lot of runway. Um, and he's also independently fairly wealthy. So like, like those, that, that was interesting too, because if he's independently, fairly, yeah, okay. he's done well off. He's like, he's there to fucking like build something big versus like, Oh my gosh, like I can't do this. I gotta go work at Google and make a million dollars. He can make a million dollars at Google, right? Well, if he's like, independent wealthy, after he's just gonna invest his own money in it. Yeah. And better. so he has a runway. So I feel like so those were the factors that even though I hated the idea, you know, I'd say to, you know, make a bet, right? I make these small bets. Yeah. And then hopefully a, a good flop. Like I the, the poker term is perfect for investors, right? Like I, I love poker. It's like, all right, I'll you know, I I'll, I'll throw in my big blind or you know, put the small blind, I'll see what the flop looks like, right? And then that's gonna be based on the the, the hands or the the starting hand of yeah. the founding team, right? And then and then based on that, that's where you got your parada, you know, it's the hands yeah. are matching up yeah. where it's gonna scale and then you can put in a little more chips. Yeah. So it's a good terminology. Like a lot of angel investors love or VCs love poker because it's like very similar mm -hmm. from a psychological standpoint. So you 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 your your demogra your vertical is AI. I mean, yeah. I mean AI I think so I know, you know I know so broad, but yeah. Is there a Non AI vertical, you be you might invest in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, like what's some what's some other broker you you might be interested in investing in? I mean, I invested in like, uh, uh, you know, back in two thousand sixteen, uh, Madison Reed, a hair coloring kit for women, right? They're they're having explosive growth, just based on some of the early, and that was not a C bet, that was like a Series A bet. Um, you know, Element, I love the drink, and I made a small bet on them, and they're, um, you know, I'm helping a founder here in Seattle. With potential seed raise for mushroom coffee yeah um i'm a big fan of her product so you know I, I just try to help you know where i can if it's like a and then they have a lot of traction already mm -hmm. um so i know that the product has uh potential given that the market's really like they have like a few million sales so i'm sure you get like, yeah. a lot of code emails code outreach yeah what can a founder like put on the code email like make you want to open the email like, is like a I mean, I, I look at everything, but, you know, usually, you know, they want to just share like, you know, the credit, you know, how credible they are. Also social put matters, right? If you say, hey, this other super angel invested in us, right? Like, you know, you know, Jeff Bezos invested in yeah. us, right? Those things matter or like we're, you know, we were in Y Combinator, mm -hmm. right? Those type of like labels matter. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can put, you know, if you can highlight, you know, some of those labels that might be attractive, 
is important. Or you can say, hey, we already, you know, we already have like 500K in order, yeah. right? Th those type of like either okay. the traction, data points, the social proof, right? Or some of the advisors and investors that are, you know, that are that I would know. And then also the team, like, hey, we're X, like, you know, X AI ML scientists at Google Brain or something, right? Those, I mean, that team, you know what I mean? Those things yeah, really. Yes. Does, you know. does soft traction matter? Like post somewhere emails and say, we have like, I don't know. Um, we've done a hundred beta tests, 25 letter, uh, 35 letters intent. You know, we have 50,000 followers on our newsletter, blah, blah, blah. But we only have uh, like limited sales. Does that matter? Or yeah. That I mean, a lot of the open source, I like, like there's, there's people that we invested in that just have massive traction in terms of just users, but no revenue. I mean, look at, look at Meta initially, right? Like it depends on your business model, right? Yeah. Like there's some, like a lot of open source companies that are, they're not going to monetize for, for years. They're just trying to, you know, become that, uh, you know, popular open source, um, uh, you know, company for that specific use case. And then they'll start monetizing when it becomes massively adopted. So it depends on their, on, on the, you know, on the business model, the business. Okay. Uh, yes. You know, the use case. Have you ever thought about like starting your own incubator or accelerator? No, no, no. I mean, I know like a lot of companies who are doing venture studios and things like that. Um, I think uh, I've had this discussion with a with the managing partner of one of the biggest venture funds out here. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into too much into it because uh, there's a lot of great, you know, Madura Labs, Parent Square Labs that are you know doing good things. But maybe, I mean, I never say never. I mean, I just don't have the bandwidth right now. I yeah. have a full time, you know. Yeah. So, so what would have happened for you, like you know? To quit your full-time job and do like investments like full-time what would have to happen liquidity liquidity okay yeah you have to liquidity. hit a couple home runs so to speak yeah i mean I, I have a lot of really good things on paper but who the f cares yeah look what happened to we were convoy M millions of other companies out there right so um uh um but yeah you know definitely liquidity and uh but again this is a passion i'll be doing for the rest of my life it's just intellectually very interesting for me. It's like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, right? I just love the game. So uh, I also love my my job. Like as a, in AI, I get to work with the most brilliant, you know, AI practitioners. And I throw these great AI leaders and builders, meet us in dinners with, you know, scientists from like Microsoft and Amazon and and uh, investors who, who are in the space and, you know, be able to um, uh, enjoy that type of tribe, right? So I really enjoy my role working in AI as an operator. So it's safe to presume that you're not going to retire at 65. You're going to keep on going like, like a Warren Buffett does. And yeah, like, absolutely. You know. I don't think I'm going to retire. I mean, yeah. like I'm going to run my other mission is to get MVP to over, you know, one B plus in AUM. And so that's so far off from that. Um, and time is a compound interest and time is the number one factor, right? I think, yeah. I think Charlie Warren Buffett made most of his like 90% of his wealth after 65 mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that whole compound interest, like it's magic, but you need a lot of time. So um, I think it will get there if I keep it up until 100 years old, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, but I might be doing bigger deals then, right? Yeah. Where, it's, where it's much easier to get to that number, right? If I, if I um, do, I'm even interested in private equity stuff, right? Private equity, you know, I have a friend who's very, you know, doing really well in private equity. And these are big deals, you know, buying 50, 60, 100 million companies. And then, you know, if you grow them and they can easily be a B overnight for one deal, right? Um, and then a lot of times he doesn't even use his own money. Like he has some investor money, some money, but he uses bank money because it's actually existing cash. Yeah. So I'm open-minded to that, right? It's a, you know, I, there's going to be a, a early stage pre-seed seed. There's going to be growth stage, real estate, and I see PE. Like I want a balanced portfolio because I think all that stuff is fun, um, you know, uh, uh, to, to really like explore. Do you have like a, like a vision board that you use? Like, you know, like, like, like do different paths where you want like your career, like, like one, one part of the vision board might be like, you know, number one investor AI, another part of the vision board might be like, uh -huh. you invest in this or no vision part uh -huh. of the vision board, like, you know, be a better, you know, family man. Do you have anything like that? Yeah, um, I used to, uh, I actually have sort of like a, I have a bunch of books of, of people who I, I really admire, like in front, you know, um, that I kind of use as like my you know, motivation of like who I want to become. Like, I mean, I even have like, a, uh, a magazine of like, you know, Kobe Bryant, right? Like I love his grit and passion. And then I have, you know, a bunch of autobiographies, right? From like Benjamin Franklin to like, 
you know, to uh, even Marcus Aurelius is on there, to Peter Peterson, who was a former founder of uh, Blackstone. Yeah, who passed away. And like, I love these autobiographies, right? And so like, those are some of the people that I really loved. You know, I read a lot of autobiographies. I used to read a lot of autobiographies. So, you know, um, I would have a wall of them, right? Kind of as a, as a sort of a vision board inspiration. No. Dude, I don't know you just said. You see the video? It was um, the Lakers are just from the, the NBA championship, and they were playing the Olympics that summer, right? And so Paul Gasol was on the Spain team, mm -hmm. and it was Kobe Bryant, LeBron, James, other different players. And Kobe Bryant said, I know they were in the first play. I'm running through Paul Gasol's fucking chest. Every one of the players like, ain't no fucking way. That's the team you're not doing that. Mm -hmm. First play, they set a screen, Kobe Bryant. Yeah, ran, I saw that video. Ran the fuck over. Savage. Like, like yeah. You're, Passion. Like, you're my yeah. guy, but... Fucking win is the most important thing, and like like you said, yeah, so many people don't have that don't have that commitment. Don't have that, and a lot of it that that grit again. I think it's genetics. I mean, um, that's where I say this free will, like it's nature and nurture, right? I mean, some people have that killer instinct. Um, uh, some people don't, and it's fine, right? Like everybody's born with different talents and, and skill sets, and they have different areas that they can excel. At. Being an amazing father, being an amazing parent, being an amazing politician. I mean, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it just depends. Kobe was a, you know, uh, he was known for his incredible work ethic yeah. and grit. And, uh, I mean, he passed away way too early. He was also yeah. a that was very a successful, shock. that was a shock. Yeah. Investor. He was actually, a, wanted to be a venture capitalist. Yeah. And in fact, uh, there's a couple of deals that he invested in, um, I believe through his fund. And, and did you hear what Kobe Bryant did after they won the U S won the Olympics? No. So fast, they win, they win the gold medal over Spain. Fast forward to like, like Lakers training camp. Yeah. Kobe put his fucking Olympic gold medal in Paul Gasol's locker. Oh, really? Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> like, uh, damn, fucking savage. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and uh, yeah, some people are just born with that type of super high. Do you think that can be learned? Do you think someone can be like kind of lethargic, kind of lazy? No. And then like, I mean, I could and, be wrong. And at 30, like turn it on like that. Like I said, I, I believe this is where I, I, um, I believe people don't change. Like, yeah. Unfortunately, um, yeah. Unfortunately. I, I, I agree with that, yeah. Yeah, I believe that people, and I, 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 I try to change every day. Like, I, you know, my mental and physical transformation is a mission of mine every day. So I always try to be open-minded to, to learn and grow new things and keep a very open mind. Like, I would, you know, you can convince me on some conspiracy theory. I'll be open-minded for you to give me the data yeah. for me to change your mind. Like, you can even try to convince me that, that the that the earth is flat and I'll listen. Yeah. I have friends who are flat earthers. But you got the side eye still like, yeah. I'll, I'll listen. Yeah, I was, but I'll try to look at the data and see if there's something interesting as substance, but I will actually consider any theory, as long as you genuinely believe it and you aren't fucking crazy. Like, yeah. I don't want you to be like mentally deranged and start spitting a bunch of bullshit. But if you have some conviction and you have some type of like logical, like data points, I will ingest that and see if, you know, I can see your perspective. Yeah. Um, and so, especially even from a political front, right? like I see all these crazy Trumps, you know, people who love Trump, people who never got, I hate this. I feel like I wish we can start understanding their point of view, right. And having yeah. a lot of empathy and saying, okay. And then unite. Like, I think, you know, people are like not open to people's other ideas and perspectives yeah. because of these fucking labels. Like, oh, I'm I a agree. Democrat and you're Republican. I said, who the fuck cares? We're just, you know, we're human you know, we're, we're, we're homo sapiens on this rock spinning, you know, hundreds of miles. You're right. We're a fucking rock sun. spinning in the fucking, yeah. fucking pin of nowhere. We're, we're like arguing about like yeah. these little labels, right? Yeah. Uh, I saw this somewhere where like, um, that like, really makes me upset. Yeah. I think, I think, I think the, what's the side I was, I think it was a Voyager was out there and someone, I can't remember, someone asked and asked like, can you turn the Voyager around and take a picture of Earth? They took a picture of Earth and like, you can't even tell what Earth is, right? It's like a little speck and all mm -hmm. these little rocks and stuff. You're like, yeah. So yeah, and the flat earth say that's all made up, right? Um, the moon lane didn't exist, yeah. you know. It's, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, then there's a lot of interesting simulation theory that moon doesn't exist without looking at it. So everything's just a simulation. So yeah, you know, we it renders as we see it. So you know, there's actually a lot of interesting math and stuff that actually can even prove that. If you if you ever spend time, like, go on Donald Hoffman. He he has a good TED talk on case against reality. Um, very convincing. I've I listened to hours and hours of his. I even bought his book. Uh, very interesting. Again, like he had a, he's a very credible guy. You know, he studied under, 
you know, he's a, I think a physics major, and PhD, studied under what, you know, a lot of the, um, he, at MIT, and now he's a professor at the UC school. But he made a very interesting, he's the one that really got me to consider the simulation theory, is Donald Hoffman. Okay. He's really good. Absolutely. Really interesting guy. And uh, do you already talk about, don't you do like a monthly uh, AI meetup? Yeah, so with Great Coquilo, it's been a little bit on a hold because I've been doing other um, private dinners. So that's sponsored by, you know, prominent venture capitalists. So we're doing more like curated events. Like sometimes I feel like when you get all these people kind of come in, it's really hard to, and yeah, they're all, the they're all different journeys in their AI ML price. So you might have like a, you know, for example, a Y Combinator guy that just landed money and then another, you know, student that is considering AI. And then it's just sometimes the conversation is not, or you have, somebody that shows up who's in aspiring to be an AI ML, they might be a product manager at Amazon, but not really involved in any type of AML. So we wanted to sort of curate a kind of a theme based uh, group where you can nerd out on specific topics. So I love those. Like for example, I, I, you know, those meetups, like Tim Ferriss meetup, I went up there. I'm a big Tim Ferriss fan. Do you know who he is? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just book. Yeah. Like, he's tools of Titans. Tools of Titans, together, you know, for our buddies. Book, so, yeah. so me and Tim were actually clubbing buddies back in early 2000s. Oh, sick. Yeah, we used to bar hop together. Yeah. We're famous. So I, I, I'm i a big fan of Tim Ferriss. You know, there was also All In Podcast meetups. And I like those meetups, you know, um, where, you know, you're there because you are a tribe of their, their content. So there's a lot to really discuss, right? And so for these AI events, you know, the last one was like, you know, auto agents. And it was specifically for people who are, AI scientists, AI product manager leaders who are actually really building AI into production. So for your events, you have to be like invited. To yeah, yeah, these events. are invited events. Okay, these like. But then we're gonna do some general uh, happy hour stuff. Um, and then uh, you know, luckily we got some sponsors who 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 want to sponsor those events. Um, we have one coming up on June twentieth, um, in Capitol Hill. So, uh, we're yeah. gonna be. When you do these events, what's your intent? Is like, just to put on a great event, like put smart people together, like. Is there anything you personally want to get out of it? Yeah, the intent is just, yeah, to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the intent is is fun for me, right, to talk about AML and also getting uh, the community together, um, uh, meeting interesting people, right, whether, you know, uh, to join a team or invest or, you know, whatever, right, or, you know, even at Scientific, like, there might be opportunities where, you know, we can be helpful. So there's, you know, there's, there's many different fronts of getting like-minded people in a room and seeing if there's a, you know, mutual beneficial collaboration opportunity, right? Is there any like a upcoming AI person in Seattle that people should know about? Like either on the data scientists or someone about uh, a great product or like, I know it's like probably dozens of people to choose from. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't really. Yeah. I mean, there's so many talented people and the AI is just changing all the time. And again, um, the the interesting ones, interesting people doing work in the AI is like they have a, you know, they have a unique data mode and they're, you know, or they have some type of a unique um, uh, data mode where they can build some very interesting AI applications. So I've met a lot of interesting people in the space who based on having access to that. And that's why all the mega techs are winning the AI wars, right? Because they have the capital compute. Yeah. They have a lot of the data. Is this such thing as like the birth date of AI? Birthday? Yeah, birth, like when it started. I mean, it's probably from Hinton guy. I don't know, a long time ago from Charles. Uh, I mean, I don't know. That term was definitely coined someday. I don't know. It was a long time ago, but you can probably Google it. Um, um, forgot that gentleman's name, but yeah, I'm, it was probably in the 40s or 50s or 60s. Okay. But still relatively new. Even those 40s, 50s, that's still relatively new. Like if you go to the history of mankind, that's still pretty new, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the history of mankind, but. You know, history of mankind's only been what 150, 200,000 years, which is mind blowing. Yeah, it's nothing. I think we're somewhere like if, if human history is on a. You put a human history on the calendar of all like all time. We're like start like noon on December thirty. Yeah, it's like a thing now. So it's like a. I think the planet in theory came to five billion years ago or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Earth, and then Homo sapiens, all that whatever that was like two hundred something years ago. So yeah, that sounds right. So it's quite. In theory, right? Again, if you in believe theory, in simulation yeah. theory, whatever, yeah. or, or you're, you know, or if you, uh, different if you religion, you believe yeah. like you believe like Christians believe like it's only that. six thousand years, like six thousand years old, yeah. right? So I mean, hey, I don't know, you know, I mean, look at the data and whatever data, and then again, people will manipulate the data based on weighing the data, right? Like, mm -hmm. 
the Bible says this. So, you know, that's, that's the ground truth. Right. So, you know, to each their own. I mean, yeah. I don't really, I think one thing I, I realized in life is like people genuinely want the truth and, uh, you can't really argue what their truth is because they're not ready for it. Maybe you can kind of sort of give suggestions, but people, it will, it will, it will fuck up their whole paradigm of living. Yeah, that's right. right. A lot of people are in their paradigm, right? Yeah, yeah. The and bu it's, paradigm it's, bubble, you want to, what you want to call it, right? Yeah, that you spend. So, you know, I mean, whatever serves them to be happy and productive citizen of the species, you can fucking believe in the Easter bunny or whatever is, this, you know, and, and if you're happy and good person, you know, whatever you believe, right? So... Um, yeah, I don't, I never get into debates about any of that stuff. I, I throw out there if they're open-minded mm -hmm. because I don't even know, right? I yeah. have, you know, if you were saying, so what would you choose now? It's obviously I'll choose science of like, you know, yeah. the whole, but the simulation theory is super interesting, right? Like from reading Donald Hoffman stuff. Uh, and, uh, the other thing is super interesting, but again, they're just interesting, uh, um, you know, thought experiments, right? That yeah, I don't really, true. I don't really like hold anything really that yeah for me i think I, yeah, I think for you like post you don't debate like you should be able to debate either side right yeah i mean yeah, yeah i like, can debate either side yeah i can uh, debate fine. the bible's real or i can debate the bible's not real right I yeah think, i think people like debate both sides and have more open yeah mind, just stuff you know yeah i would be curious how you're going to debate the bible is real. i mean the bible is real i mean what, what do you define as real like yeah. bible is Did real it really happen or is but, that the is oh, this, it was all a, the data in the Bible actually happen, and is like everything they say is actually like factual true. There's actually a lot of factual truth. Oh, is this a book of fables, the greatest stories ever told? Yeah, in yeah. yeah. So, so this it depends on what you what you about. mean by real truth, and this is where language is is restricted, oh, limited, too, yeah, right? Like, like we we don't we you know my my one of my favorite uh, quotes is the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms from Socrates, and I love that because. You can be arguing about something, but you're defining the term differently. So it's really important to really like free will. Like people get totally like, you know, like super like, oh, of course I have free will. Blah, blah. It's like, it's like <laughs> let's define free will, right? Like this is my definition. And then this, this define what's the opposite of free will. Like opposite of free will is like deter deterministic, meaning like from the big bang and then Einstein believe that like that literally is everything's predetermined. There's nothing you can do from the big bang. We're all physics particles, you know, working, you know, on a certain frequency, right? That's the, that's like the, the, you know, and that's a lot of people believe that a lot of neuroscientists, physicists, the smartest people on the fucking planet don't believe that free will is sort of illusion. But then again, it's how do you define free will? But then there's also the most brilliant physicists, scientists who are strong Christians too. I mean, that's a <laughs> paradox, right? Yeah. It's, it's mind, mind blowing. There's, there's, there's a. There's a podcast called Closer to the Truth. I used to listen to it all the time. And they had a they had a, a, a theologian slash brilliant mathematician physicist um, who's also Christian. And I mean, again, Christian, if you look at the history of Christianity, it's actually a beautiful thing, depending on all the wars and stuff that's bad, but like it, it it brought people together, give hope to the poor, right? So there's that tribalism, that society that was uh, you know, helped to, you know, grow through that Christian Right, right. So it 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 kind of served us. It gives us a fucking United States, right? So, you know, um, so there there's good things about religion, and you know, obviously the bad part is just this this fighting against this religion is true, and you're going to hell like as a Christian, whatever, right? I, I that's why I love Buddhism. If I could pick any religion, it'd probably be Buddhism. I'm not religious in any way, um, um, but Buddhism seems to be more non, I guess confrontational to other religions. They seem to be more accepting. Yeah. So here's a, like a big decision point, right? I don't see if you realize this. So way back in the day, Emperor Constantine, Emperor Constantine who was fighting a civil war, he was going to battle against his, like people fighting against. He was outnumbered. He should have lost, right? Uh -huh. And, you know, supposedly the story is in the, in the sky was the sign of the cross and the voice said, with this conquer, right? So uh -huh. Constantine took, I actually have a tattoo on my body yeah. right here. Yeah. Took this cross, put all the shield, they won the battle, right? And then Constantine, you know, quote unquote, um, converted Christianity. Yeah. And that's, and that's how Christianity came, right? Of course, all those stories will say, well, no, it's only did flick the expedient. Well, no, because all the Roman, all, all the Roman soldiers said the same thing. Of course, they can say the fucking same thing. They uh -huh. don't want to die. And then, you know, the thing is they combine, like, you know, like the sun holiday with the birth of Christ, which claims Christmas, like combined, like all the holidays together, right? Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I don't think people realize that, right? And if he would have just said, like, odds are he probably made the story up, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Odds he made the story up, right, to kind of combine the people behind him, right? And just, you know, no one knows the truth, I don't think, right? Yeah. That's a great story, though. Yeah, I mean, especially, um, I think it would be fun to study, like, something if I had more time, I would study a lot of history, because I find history is stranger than fiction, which is, right? Very fascinating. I just have, I have just, I have so much, only have so much time and day. Mm -hmm. I've been sort of focusing on, on areas that will serve my, my mission. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you got to you know, decide to focus. Yeah. Right. But if I had more free time, like if I was like, you know, done with all my whatever financial obligations, I'd probably study a lot of philosophy, history. Um, yeah, those are very fascinating, right? It's like mind blowing, right? If you, you know, you read some of the history. It's like, that shit really happened. Yeah, it's some crazy, especially like, Roman history, the shit they did back yeah. in the day. I mean, any so that's, fa that's fascinating for me. Like, I was watching a, a, a documentary on samurais in Japan. Oh my gosh. It's called uh, The Age of the Samurai in Netflix. Have you seen it? You should watch it. Okay. It's fucking mind-blowing, right? Like, you know, um, this this country who is now all about Hello Kitties and the Japanese <laughs> are fucking savages, right? Um, the, the samurais were the savages. Yeah, the samurais are probably turning over the grave right now. Yeah. Um, but that was a very fascinating history that I didn't really, you know, um, that was a uh, really good documentary. But I can watch those all day, all night, like even different, you know, um, areas. It's, it's really fascinating how, you know, uh, people in those days. Yeah, we don't lived. realize how savage we used to be. Yeah. Like, I mean, um, not saying that TikTok's been the place you get a history from, yeah. but there's a talk, TikTok video, it's like a history one. And supposedly um, the daughter of Guinness Khan. Yeah, got, fiance got killed by this by a man in the city, right? So as punishment, she asked her diet father gives Khan to kill everyone in the city. So he went and be hit up 1.7 million people in like 10 days. Is that true? I don't know. I mean, it sounds it true. Sounds true as fuck, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that sounds like Guinness Khan would want it would do. I mean, but if it's true or not, I mean, I don't know. Like I said, TikTok's probably not the best place to get your history lesson from, but yeah, there are. I mean, you know, I I I believe it. I mean, there's a lot of. And people don't realize how savage. savage you see me back in the day, even like 100 years ago, right? The Wild yeah. Wild West, just, you know. I mean, I was watching some Joe Rogan podcast on his going to say, we're all just sons and daughters of rapists and murderers, right? Yeah. You think about um, the history of mankind. If you actually, you know, I, I probably, you know, I'm, I'm a son of a Genghis Khan, right? Like, I have Genghis Khan blood in me, yeah. right? So uh, I think they say like one of every people are alive now, dude. Yeah, something like that. I mean, you can, you know. I mean, we're all related somewhere back in theory, right? Unless you believe in the simulation theory. Right? I mean, or the, you know. When you think about all of us somewhere down the line have the same great, 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 you know, 10th generation grand grandparents some kind of way, right? Yeah. We go back far enough in time. Yeah. So you still got to leave a couple, at the three o'clock. I can, I can go a little longer. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, it's just, it's like amazing. Like there's so many like scientists who are like atheists, a few across you know, a few of them were like believe in God. Like, it is kind of kind of. So, what is God? Though? Like, how do you define God? Right? Like, I think a lot yeah, of yeah, scientists are right. actually very spiritual mm -hmm. because if you, if a lot, you if a like lot of people quantum believe mechanics, and if they really, if you like understand like how miraculous the human body and how miraculous things have have to happen, there must be some higher power, higher God. But you know that you know, even Einstein believed in some. He said God to him was just this universal like. I got his quote, but he was very spiritual because, you know, he knew that there has to be some I mean, higher... Yeah, you're right. Somehow... I mean, he didn't believe in some, you know, Jesus was a savior or, you know, Muhammad was... I mean, but like he had his own... He believed in something much higher. So he was very, very spiritual in a way. I mean, a, lot of, a lot of scientists are that. Stuff way. works, right? Our human body works, you know, yeah. the, all the stuff. The, I mean, that's miraculous. There must yeah. be some God that, yeah, like, you know, made this all. But, then but again, what is God, right? But then again, I think the argument people are like, if there's a God... Why do we have cancer? Why do you have like these diseases, right? If there's a yeah. perfect God, how can you make the perfect body? And of course, Chris would say, why? Well, because original sin fucked it all up. Yeah, know, yeah. All these theories, you know, but yeah. Yeah. But, but, but the fact that all that, like, st so all this stuff works, right? Basics is lined up perfectly. Yeah, like the move one inch off, the should be fucked up, you know, everything works. Yeah, there's good a lot enough. of, this so, works good enough. Yeah. What, what, there's an amazing order to this universe, right? And it's like, you know, that can be, uh, you know, mapped out through equations and math that this unbelievable structure and order is like, it's like the argument that there's some, you know, God, but again, you know, it could just be billions and years of evolution and how, you know, all the 
you know, magnetic stuff and atoms and everything. It's just, you know, it's all, you know, the laws of physics that, you know, has made all this structure possible given, you know, and it's elements like, of the world. Back to Northern Lights, elements. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone saw them over the like, last two weekends. They were all oh, great, great things they are. They're so beautiful. Go back one time, 2,000 years, and those people seeing see the Northern Lights, they were like freaked out, like, the gods are coming to us. We know, yeah, it's like an we, omen. We need to sacrifice of virgins. Like, yeah. It's because they, they have no frame of reference, right? Yeah. Now it's like you understand science, all that kind of stuff, you know. No, oh, it's great. No big deal, you know. Even five, a thousand years ago, the war's coming to end, you know. Yeah, that's, that's where, you know, science and everything is helpful to basically demystify some of these natural phenomena, right? Versus it's happened from some act of God, whether they're, they're happy or not. So that's why I really believe that, you know, I, I love, you know, people who are moving the needle and science and, you know, explaining some of these interesting, you know, basically trying to give us clarity on how everything works, right, from a, the, in the physical world, right? So, so um, you're a big science guy. I, I wouldn't say I'm a big science guy. I'm actually lately been a big kind of neuroscience, neuroscience. guy in terms of like trying to understand how, you know, and there's a lot of parallel between neuroscience and AI. Like at the ultimately, the holy grail is is creating AI models that can be as good as a human brain, right? Because the human brain is quite miraculous, like 86 billion neurons, but the 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 voltage is only like like a light bulb, right? So that's like miraculous in a way. It's like mind blowing miraculous. It's like a supercomputer that is a uh, you know very low uh, electricity voltage to keep to run and operate, right? And so Ultimately, like people, AI scientists are trying to study the brain, right? To be able to develop a AGI or something, you know, as sophisticated as that. So with the Neuralink, I have no idea it works, but the Neuralink would it be Me possible, either. would it be possible like this nerding out, like you go to somewhere, say, I won't get, I won't get the Neuralink. And the Neuralink, I want to be like based on history, um, AI and learning how to farm apples, right? And take that neural link and put it in your brain like matrix. and instantly have all that knowledge in there. Like matrix. I mean, I don't know. I haven't I haven't looked into all the how it works to to comment. I mean, theoretically, I mean, that's not very hard to do, right? Like, you know, I mean, like you have all that information here, but it's what's it's the the bandwidth is is very um, slow. So if you can actually, but again, um, I don't know. I mean, it's in theory, like what. What I understand from watching limited um, stuff on Elon, and Elon's trying to lower this latency or bandwidth factor through a Neuralink. So if he accomplishes that, it's like anything, it's like literally having a computer. Yeah. So yeah, all that stuff is is a very easy use case. Like he's solving these very difficult use cases, right? People who can't, you know, can only move their eyes and then they yeah. can, you know, do it. The guy has it now, he's like, like he's doing all that stuff, right? Yeah, which is fascinating. Like, I, again, I, I need I, to I, I, spend I, some time and kind of yeah. reading up on that. So, um, or watch. Elon Musk figures out how to get to Mars. He sends an email. Hey, Ken, I need a guy like you on my first. Fuck no, hell no. <laughs> Why the fuck do I want to go to Mars? I mean, do you have you seen Mars? Martian, the like, it's a, it's yeah. a. Poor, I'd rather be in Maui or yeah. like in this planet. And I mean, this is something that I, I actually um don't understand. Like, I understand the big picture of like if the human species, you know, with global warming, if that happens, right? Um, and then this world, uh deteriorates and is not inhabitable, then yeah, you want a plan B, right? Yeah. But I think Jeff Bezos even said one time, like this Mars stuff is stupid. I mean, just create a great, nice space station up in the sky, yeah. right? Because, but then uh, Elon would say, you would do put like a nuke up into the atmosphere so you can make it more like, so, you know, it, it, it depends. Like if he makes it beautiful like Earth, yeah. but if it's in this current state, why the hell would I want to go to Mars? Unless, your, unless I know uh, Earth is like going to be dead, and then I'll consider it. But it's not your adventure, right now. Ken? Your sense of adventure. Go, uh, no, go, hell no. Go there for two years. No, stay away fuck from your no. Family, you know. No, no, no. I, I, I have die. zero interest for that. <laughs> I'd rather take a flight to freaking Maui. I'd rather take a flight to like you know Spain, Barcelona. Yeah. 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 I mean, so I mean, at the state, I mean, would you go? Would you go? No, I wouldn't no. go. Maybe on the fifteenth or twentieth flight, maybe. Yeah, I mean, again, what, what's the give me, the, give me yeah. what's the circumstance? Like, Earth yeah. is going to be dead in a year? Yeah, of course I go. Like, yeah, or no, we'll go there and we'll, you know, you know, like, what's the cell space? The current cell space, you just want to go there and fly at this current, like, hell no, right? It's I gotta, think right now the travel time is two years based on all those math and moves yeah. and stuff. 
they get down maybe a month. And maybe. then even if you make it, like there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right? Like so many so things. Maybe I might even higher percentage of me because after they do many trips, so I know like they've actually worked out all the you know potential issues that could happen going on that long flight. I mean, it's not even been. I don't even know when Elon can accomplish yeah. actual. I mean, I don't know, ten years. Yeah. So this is one thing I think I think is gonna happen soon, like maybe ten years. I think. It'll be, I don't know. I think we're, I think we're gonna have like space hotels in space, right? Where people go to outer space, like a kind of like a cruise ship. Oh, so that's what I think like, would be nice, like a like, huge like, space resort. Yeah, that's right? how things gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe ten years. And so this is something else I, I believe too, right? This is like really like fucking fantasy shit, right? So you know how you have dreams. Oh, I have dreams every night. I think you. I do, you think, have, do you dream every night? Yeah, I think. I you, think you, do you remember your dreams? Not sometimes, but I think when you have a dream, that's another version of you somewhere else trying to tell you something. So there's all these versions of you somewhere, and that dream is like a part of their story. Do you believe that? I do. So, like, for example, suppose you have a dream, like with no reference. Like, you might dream that um, you went to vacation on Maui with your family. And then something happened, right? Like a lot of time you have dreams that like that you, you like you have, that it's like this didn't happen, right? But in your dream is so gross, so re it's, it's a reality, right? Yeah, like, it, you at that time with fascinating with dreams, no matter how crazy it is, you believe it's real. Yeah. Unless you unless you do what you call um what's that where you know you're dreaming? It's called um it's a term where you know you know you're dreaming. You yeah. know that? I know you're talking about, yeah. Yeah. I um, I just think that's like your other version of yourself communicating with you or like Trying to tell you, hey, this is what's going on over here. I, of course, I have no proof of that, you know. like It's subconscious stuff. Like, yeah. uh, I actually, uh, um, Huberman had somebody on Dreams with the guy. There's a guy, there's a sleep, remember that sleep guy that talks about why, you know, sleep, he's a sleep doctor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so right. Huberman, uh, Joe Rogan, yeah, I watched him. It's very interesting. So Dreams is actually good. When you dream, it's actually therapy in a way. Like, you release a lot of these subconscious anxiety angst through dream like with this so it's actually when bad things happen to dream it's actually good you kind of release that it's like oh i'm alive yeah so i really love that because i have i suddenly have really bad dreams um um so and when i have that really bad dream it's kind of therapy where you kind of let it out and you're still alive even if like somebody's trying to kill you yeah. like i've had dreams where you're, you're running and you can't run yeah. and like you know these so nightmares I have, a, I have a dream like that so when i was a little kid yeah. i watched this scary movie right and like these demons came to the windows all this kind of stuff yeah. right and so I went to sleep that night and, you know, Matthew came, Walker, yeah. his name, said, you should watch his uh, podcast. And, and then my dream, you sleep. Th this demon came through the fucking window, right? To this day, you can't tell me, right? I still have this dream once in a while where this fucking demon comes to the window and tries to get me right. Uh-huh. And we all have those type of, you know, uh, dreams, nightmares. Yeah. We all do. It's just, I think every person does. And I, I want to say, I don't people realize, I don't people realize, I think a lot of people think that they go to sleep, the brain like rest, the brain is still actually Very operating. Active. Like yeah. same high level um, activity, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm not a neuro neuroscientist. I just like to, you know, read about it. And, um, but uh, yeah, Matthew Walker is somebody you should listen to. Uh, he talks about why we dream, and the, and the. So I actually dream every night, and I remember some parts of my dreams, which is rare. I think when I ask people and do like a survey, most people don't remember the dreams. If I had a uh, guess, I think I remember like. 15, 20% of my dreams. Yeah. I like do a rough guess. So I dream. So that's like my superpower. I sleep well. Um, I think because I'm very active. Um, How many hours of sleep you got to get a night? I probably average seven to eight hours, okay. which is um, that's what, average. I'm, what I go for. Not average. Most people don't sleep. They say the average Americans are like six something. Is it? Yeah. Oh, man. That's, yeah. That's it's, good. it's hard. Yeah. Uh, you want to get 70 hours of sleep unless yeah. you have this interesting uh, gene where you don't need to. Yeah. I have a friend. Like one of my best friends, Kiyoki Brothers, known him since I was in the army in 1920. To this day, he only needs four hours of sleep a night. Yeah, there's some people with that genetic um, gene. Very rare. Yeah. But if he has it, you know, um, I wish I kind of had it. Like I, I do too, be honest. I wish I didn't need to sleep. Then I can, you know, yeah, work me, on my hobbies. I need like seven hours of sleep a night. If I go like three or four days in a row, like four or five, I can operate, but I definitely like degrade. Uh -huh. And for me, if I sleep like nine or more, it's the same as me not getting enough sleep. If I sleep nine or more, I'm like, yeah. It's yeah, bad enough to get enough sleep sleep for me. Yeah, sleeping for me is my one of my favorite hobbies. <laughs> like I really love sleep. Um, I also you, like taking naps. Sometimes. You take power naps in the afternoon. I can take power naps. Yeah, yeah. If I have time. I think those and are I the best just things. Cleanse all the toxins. And Matt Walker talks about that too. I'm trying to think about that dream where you know you're dreaming and so you can act like Superman and fly. Mm -hmm. You know what it's called? It's called um. I know what you're talking about yeah. I can't yeah, I get a few of those maybe once or twice yeah. a year.
you ever like have a dream then wake up and like shit this is a good this is a good dream then you go back to sleep and try to get back in the dream oh yeah of course yeah of course like winning some lottery or like uh remember i was at a casino sometime when the jackpot <laughs> Gonna celebrate get bottle service at some encore or something <laughs> yeah definitely like, uh, I mean, so what advice you have for founders i mean like in they can like it's kind of like a broad scope like like early early stage founders someone thinking of an idea like mm -hmm. any like any advice i mean the best advice i i mean a lot of the just validated through you know customer um you know prospect uh you know uh discussions right validate whether it's um something that you want to spend five ten years and life on because you know i mean um because you don't want to go all in on something that you haven't validated right um so another one that i always like to say for founders is like take care of your mental physical health like you know get your sleep in exercise avoid alcohol as much as possible I, you know i love alcohol like i'm you know me like i i you know i enjoy whiskey i enjoy Cars, I enjoy the fact that he's not drinking bourbon is just fucking blow my mind right yeah now. because uh you know i um i did 75 hard you know actually uh i remember brian um byron mentioned that he was on it and he was like you're you're too weak to do it and i'm like i don't even want to fucking do fucking 75. i love going out and enjoying my my wine and beer but uh i just decided to do it um and i went 90 days without alcohol um i actually i slipped up once because some guy gave me an a beer that i told him it was na it was actually in san jose and it was a it was a regular beer, but you know, I just basically, I couldn't tell the difference. Um, but yeah, the, the mental physical performance I get from not drinking is like a, a game changer. So now I, even though I, I finished the same of heart, like I literally lost the desire to drink before for me, like my life was around partying. Like I probably party more than a hundred average men in the U S like, you know, in my twenties and thirties, dude, like, like I could literally start four o'clock and go to like 6 a.m. Yeah, you yeah. told me some of like, the stories yeah, before. Yeah, like, because so I actually have the alcoholic gene. Yeah, maybe tell me that. Yeah, so it's 5% of the population, and Huberman talks about it. So alcohol, for most people, if you get two or three drinks, it gives you a little buzz, you know, pretty good, and then it gets you tired, right? For me, like, if I drink alcohol, like, it's like strong Red Bull. And I can, like, literally, like, it just, like, like, I feel great. I feel more energetic. Like, I can take a shot of tequila and just, just, I can go all night, right? Um luckily you know i i didn't have that you know dependency where you know i was able to just turn it on and off like you know when i go out on weekends and stuff but uh yeah i just had a, a, a crazy tolerance and you know some days i will do it but as a neuroscience guy like i study it it's not fucking good for you i <laughs> wish it was like it's not i i trust me i was look, trying to look at all this argument that some drinking is good for you it, drinking is actually good for you in the social element like like, uh, and you know, like I, if I celebrate a deal or celebrate a big win, like, you know, celebrating over wine and I, I'm going to do that. Right. But I'm also a biohacker, meaning like I, as a guy that studies the human brain and, 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 and health, you know, I just, I just feel no too much. Right. Like I, I can still enjoy this, you know, but it's like, it's, it's like, I know too much. Like there was a one time in my life, I was kind of a gambling addict, right. Where I would go out to the casinos and play high six poker. And I was like, and then I started studying mathematics and understanding probability and it totally ruined my love for gambling. Like I just, like when I go to the casinos, you know, like it's boring for me because I kind of know too much about the mathematics that it ruined the f joy of like, because I'm like, I know I'm going to lose. Like there's the reason why Bellagio is like a multi-billion accomplice. Like there's, and it's like for me to think that I can win is like, and it's like statistically, mathematically, everything is just doesn't make any sense. You got to be logical. Alcohol, same way, right? Like I started looking at the neuroscience of it. I got it first time when I went 90 days, no alcohol. Like I just feel like amazing. Like if, what I realized is I was basically hungover or partying for most of my life. So I would say as a founder, like take care of the mental and physical health um, and uh, because you need it, right? Um, and so I say that a lot. It's like, you know, make sure you get your sleep, you know, um, that's another warning fact. If I meet a founder and they, I hate to say, it, but they're have a substance issue or like they can't, you know, they're going out way too much, not responsible. Like I know that's going to impact their, you know, their way of life or performance, you know. And as an investor, I want them to be like fucking Olympic athletes. You know what I mean? Like like super yeah, like focused, and you know, driven. focused and driven Kobe, and optimized. Yeah, yeah. Like Kobe Bryant is not going out slamming, you know, 
doing weed and doing lines of coke or whatever, or drinking till midnight. You know, he's focused on the mission. And if he did, he's still going to be the fucking gym at four in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. He's on. A, he's a maniac on a mission. So you need that. And then you know, if you're hungover, you're not going to be a maniac on a mission. So yeah. I'm a. So I'm. I, so that's one thing. And I'm. I'm a maniac on a mission too. So I don't really. It's lost its 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 factor. It's weird. Um, because again, I don't know anybody that enjoys libation more than me. I, lo <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and I have high tolerance for it. So I will again once in a while. You yeah. know. So you already talked about this some, but any advice to people who are looking to become investors, either angel investors or join a VC fund? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's just having intellectual curiosity. If if you're drawn to it from an intellectual curiosity perspective, and then you know the space, you want to be helpful. Like you should just. Dip your toes in. It doesn't take much, you know. Even be write a small check, you know. If you feel like you know, you know you want to help these young founders, and you know you you are um, you love their vision, and and you see like given that you have some domain expertise, you, you see that they have an opportunity to execute based on gaps in the market. Like that's where maybe you can p push your bet because like yeah, I see this. Like you know, um, you know the, this recent founder that I I love, you know. You know, he there's a gap in the market that I saw because I used to be in advertising, so I knew that a lot of the optimization for ab advertising paid ads on Instagram, Amazon, made a lot of his manual on Excel sheets. He's automated that leveraging AI. So, um, and he's also done it at the highest level at all the mega techs, and then co-founders were managing hundreds and hundreds of millions of worth of you know ad budget. So, you know, I saw that. I I knew it because I had some experience, and you know, bought some chips in, right. So how do you do this? I definitely think we need to influence more people to become like angel investors, especially in Seattle, right? I mean, like, how do you convince people? Like, you know, I don't think you need to convince anybody, like, because um, you shouldn't convince people to be angel investor because angel investing is. Uh, I mean, I guess you can, but you know, like, you know, um, it's it's tough. Like, I don't think I there there are VC money out there. I think angel investing is. Uh, it's more of a, you know, yeah, I could be wrong. I mean, there are people who are very high, high net worth and you want them to support founders, right? So um, I take that back. Yeah, I mean, you don't, I don't think you convince them. You just kind of share the journey. And then they also have to be in that right uh, mindset where they understand the domain, right? Like a lot of these smart investors, like, they're very, most people are very wary of, of investing in an area that they know nothing about and they should be, right? So, like for you, like you should approach like people who understand HR, HR right? tech, yeah. B2B. Yeah, yeah, people who understand BC, this space, yeah. right? Like, um, I'm, I'm wasting my time by approach not, like a consumer tech and B2B. Or, real, or some real estate guy, right? Like yeah. I, I approach a lot of real estate guys and they're really, and they just like, it just goes way over their head. Like I have a friend who's in private equity doing very well and I bring up these starters where he's like, he's like, I don't, I don't, I have this makes no sense to me, right? There's no fucking <laughs> earnings to like even like evaluate the the, yeah. the the deal, right? And so you know, and to them, it's all about evaluating the earnings first, right? Mm -hmm. And looking at the economics. So you know, you gotta. So you can't convince anybody that they don't have the ability to really understand and be open to ingest. So you gotta find people who may, based on the life experiences and you know where their mental models have been built. Yeah. So what's your take sense. on this? I think some people will tell you only take on the only take an investment like the like the littlest amount you can, right? That's to meet your milestones, you know, get the next step right. I think other people will say, if someone gives you ten million dollars, take it, right? What's your take on that? You should take the minimum amount you can, can to stay scrappy or take all the money you can to it, get like, it depends. It depends on like the valuation. It depends on what you need the capital for. It depends on the space you're in. Like, you know, if you're trying to build a foundation LM, you need all the fucking money you need because you need to buy NVIDIA chips, right? So it depends on the business model. And it also depends on what the terms are, right? But yeah, there is this argument that if, if you raise too much money quickly, that you're going to be uh, not steward of the money, and then you're going to run into trouble in terms of not growing to that valuation. So you're going to have a major down round or a lot of the invest, you know, so it'd be hard to raise after a big round. So um, I kind of see that. I kind of want the the founder to be frugal with the you know with as much minimum capital as possible, and then they also capital, and then you know at a at a fair valuation versus raising a shitload at a like a hundred x multiple. Some people will live up to it. So like 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 I said, like it all depends. Like it's it's hard to say what's right or wrong because it depends on the business model. It depends on 
it's a founding team. If they live up to the expectation, then then hell yeah, it's a fucking great deal for the founders, right? They they have they have less dilution, and then they're a, because they executed and met the expectations of that valuation, they went on to raise more. Like that happens too. Like I know a company that fucking raised at a hundred x, and for sure I didn't think he would be able to raise it, go into that live with that but he just raised at a much higher valuation so that was like good move you know what i mean so let's so, say but then there's a lot of examples where they're you know they're they're yes. basically bankrupt because yeah. they raise way too much money yeah they, they burn they, through that they and, go then, buy, and then they go buy ivory keyboards and yeah and all kind yeah of and then there's a lot of cases they like start, that they start so, buying first class yeah so it just depends you know it's just hard to say but yeah and again based on the business model too right sometimes if you, you need to work you know raise a war chest to train your freaking foundational model, right? You're not going to win with small cash. No, no. You know, so it so, just depends. So how do you do this? Like suppose there's a, a team you want to invest in, right? But their evaluation is like totally fucking unrealistic, right? Like off the wall. And oh, I right? get that a lot. Yeah. Do, you, do you like, do you like kind of coach them up or train them or like, are you just like, man, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm not going to invest him because he's totally in the fantasy land. Well, a lot of the stuff I do are safe notes anyways. So, you know, they have a valuation cap with a discount. So, you know, a lot of times they'll, say they'll give a very high, you know, uh, cap. Um, but I know it's a, it, it's a still safe note. So it will be priced when the VC comes in and actually does a price equity round. So I, I try to, I, I, I try to be, um, so basically based on safe note, you know, there, there's more, but, um, you know, valuations a lot of times is based on the market, right? So they are using market comps, like a white commentator founder, AI is going to raise at a much higher valuation than somebody going through like, you know, a venture incubator here, right? It's just, just the way it is. So, you know, um, it just depends on the situation, right? And if they're successful raising at that cap, you know, God bless them. But if they're struggling, then you might want to say, hey, you know, here's a feedback that I'm getting from this. I told them, like, the feedback is like, the valuation is pretty high for this certain stage. Are you open to it? And they're usually open to it. Like, yeah, if someone writes a check and saying, <laughs> I want 20 million cap, but hey, I will do it at like a 15 million cap, they're going to take the check mostly, right? Yeah. So it's like, give me an offer, right? You know, it's good for them to start high. Um, but you know, just saying, you know, we're, we're, you know, we are flexible, right. But again, that flexibility is going to be based upon all the demand. I had, I had a founder that I wanted them going with a much lower cap, but they had so much interest. It's like, are you in or you're out? Right. So, yeah. so I don't think it's ever easy time to raise money if you're a founder, right. But it's like, it's especially difficult right now. Do you think putting your, like your crystal ball, do you think it's going to be like this for the next few months, next year? Or you think I mean, like what's difficult, right? I mean. There's so many companies in white commentator and work in space where they're getting all these multiple term sheets. But, um, but it's white commentator though, right? Yeah. I mean, pretty yeah. much you get to go white commentator. There's a lot of dry powder you, out you, there. You yeah. Yeah. It's guaranteed to get funding for white commentator, right? Uh, not pretty much. There's a lot of people in white commentator. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know a lot. Okay. It can be a lot. Back. I take that back. I need, uh, there's some data on this. So I'll ask my white commentator buddies. I, I would say there's a decent amount that are not able to raise a proper venture around. Maybe they raise some friends and family because they got the white commentator logo. Right, a proper venture seat, you know, from a venture guy. There's actually, I'll look at the data. Um, I'll, I'll ask my friends. I'll be the one because they I'm, have all I'm that data. I'm surprised if it's more than twenty percent don't get raise raise money from from a Y Combinator. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have that data, so I, I shouldn't comment. So take that all back. I, I want to say a lot. I meant, yeah, I would say like twenty thirty percent doesn't is when I think a lot, which is yep. a lot. Most people think it's like hundred mm -hmm. percent. Um, but I got again. Uh, I shouldn't, yeah, I should, be, I, I don't know. That was kind of my Your guess, first instinct, yeah. but not, but, said but a, I need to validate that yeah. through. But the there's data. a lot of dry powder out there, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. There's a lot of dry well, powder out there. I think what the reason why people are very scared right now is um, the moats that these large AI companies are building. So they're like, we don't know if you have room to be able to uh, get venture back returns. Like people are right now very wary because OpenAI is basically putting a lot of startups out of business. Mm -hmm. So so people are being gun shy, right, in investing because they put five million bucks in, and then also an open AI releases some feature, and they're fucking dead, yeah. right? So um, that's a concern. I mean, that's where like the the only advice I give to founders is don't say you got to show some traction or pipeline because at the end of the day, the whole business is based on like you know this kind of cash flow of future payments. So you know you want to show as much traction to get above the noise. Cause if you have no traction, then, you know, unless you have like a superstar team, right. That, you know, you need one, you, you need three teams, right? You need two out of three. One is 
you need a rock star team, right? For me, it's like, you know, the, you know, you can make half a million dollars work at Megatech, but you decided to work for nothing or 80 grand doing a startup and you got, you know, the right pedigree, whatever. Uh, two is traction, right? You have some level of traction. And three is social proof, right? Social proof is like, you have these amazing angel investors like Jeff Bezos or whatever, you know, you know, you have a uh, advisor that is, is also investing who's like a former CFO of Microsoft, you know, it's social proof, yeah. right? Yeah. So yes. you want at least two out of the three, right? Okay. So for me, as in a company that is doing AI deals that want venture returns, like there's a lot of companies out there that can make a shitload of money doing 10, 20, 30 million dollar business. But for me, it's like, I need a one B plus outcome. So it's a different game that I'm playing. Like I'm not a SBA. I'm not like a, you know, I'm a, I'm a venture scale angel investor right now. I may do private equity and growth funds later on where I'm looking at different, you know, multiples, but currently an angel investor. And then when I talk with other investors, like when I, you know, like I'm working on a deal now where, you know, they need, at least if they can't be a 1 billion or 10 billion in business, I have to pass, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it just doesn't, math doesn't pencil yeah. out. So um, that's where I, it's a bit, it's very niche where I like to, where we like to invest. Can you, know you I mean? do you have any mentors right now? Who are your mentors? I mean, my mentors are the, my, the books and uh, you know, the podcasts, you know, I had a mentor when I was young who really, in college, who really influenced my life in a big way. He he was uh, he 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 called my bullshit out. You know, he he even said I like to talk a lot of bullshit, and you know, I, my 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 data and analytic skills are very poor. So, you know, it, it put me on the quest to acquire as much you know knowledge and wisdom to sort of outgrow that. And are you mentoring okay. anyone? Not really. I mean, I mean, you know, I like to advise. You know. Um, I was texting Connor like what he should do on with this situation, this situation. I mean, I, 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 I would call that mentorship. Uh, advising. Was well, there a real difference between mentorship and advising? Yeah, I, mentorship just seems a little. Like more personal. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've had a verbal, can you mentor him? It's like, I, I don't like, I don't like that. Like, uh, I think it has to start. Yeah. I, I think you mentor more, more people than you think you are. Maybe, maybe they haven't said. No, not really. Be my, be my I'm, mentor. I'm pretty busy. I mean, I'm, I would like to, if it's the right. Um, I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I would love to give back someday, right? There much knowledge to, that I can learn you know, that that's helped me. Right. So like one of it is like, don't drink too much. Right. Like, <laughs> like, you know, when you're young, you don't want to hear that. Yeah. And so, and then a lot of times, even they're young, like they won't hear it until they're ready. Like I wasn't ready till my forties. Right. Like I was, I knew I was going out way too much, but I justify it that, you know, um, I was having a phenomenal time i was in sales and i took out clients and closing deals and this is what we do this is this is like I'm a, I, I party for a living right yeah. it's kind of <laughs> identified it you know going to trade shows events going to happy hours and parties all night i mean that was like you know two decades plus of yeah work but now i go to events and i just drink any beer okay right now yeah so i kind of asked this question before but i'm reframed right like as a founder a founders need all these skills right they have to do sales product all this one-on-one -on -one. What's the one skill like, okay, this founder isn't, isn't well, of course for you, they have to be technical, but close the founder is not really a personal person. So maybe don't, not good on social media. Maybe it's like a sales. What's the one skill you're like, okay, you don't need to have that. That they don't need to have. Yeah. Like maybe they have, but not, not as good as they should. Like maybe they're not a master salesman, right? Or maybe they're not a master of this. Yeah. What's the one skill you're like, okay, I can overlook this. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it depends on what they're building though, mm -hmm. right? Like if they're building a, you know, B2B SaaS where it's, you know, they're, they're selling to this persona, which is like a chief, I mean, they got to be able to have people skill sales people, but they were building like a deep tech AI selling to data scientists and AI engineers. So the technology will speak for itself. So it depends on what they're building. So at the end of the day, right, the CEO founder is responsible for um, a lot of its sales. They got to sell the investor. They have to sell future employees to leave their work. To take a chance on them, they have to sell their customers. So sales is extremely important. Um, that's another one that uh, I've been looking for is just that. But again, it depends on the um, what they're building, right? If it's like deep tech and this guy's effing brilliant and he's <laughs> built this really incredible, like you know, model or you know, with this with this proprietary data set, like I don't care if he's like autistic and has zero <laughs> skills, right? Then he can he can hire for that because the hard part is building that. Yeah. That technology so it just depends okay. um you know but uh one of the things that 
hopefully that I don't I, I it is a deal breaker would be like just integrity, right? Like somebody yeah. that lies or that's hard because like man, if you have somebody that has low integrity, then you know it's not going to be good. I mean, there could be. I mean, there might be instances where you know, but uh, how, how about coach, matters? How about coachability? Yeah, coachability is very important. But again, you know, I think um, you know, good founders like they're. Um, they don't even need that much coaching. Like I, I saw, I, I was talking to uh, or one of my best friends was telling me that the best founders in the portfolio are just basically you hand them a check and they're just fucking disappear, mm-hmm. and they don't want coaching. The 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 most problem child ones like, oh, can you help me out? Can you like coaching? And they wanted so much coaching, and usually yeah. those are the ones that are not making it. So like, and and there's a really good one on Bessemer founder was saying this like, you know, your investor only has like such a little time and you're asking them to like, I mean, you're going to go for advice, but if you can't, you, it's like the best founder they say is like, they literally like just give you updates. Like, Hey, we're killing it. We're ready to product market fit. We might need some help from recruiting. Can you help here? Can you make an interest to this customer? Like those are stuff. But the ones that are like need coaching on strategy, all that stuff, you know, um, those are the ones that usually won't find product market fit and scale to a very outside. But again, that's some of the stuff I've seen. I heard like the best performing portfolio of my my batch, they're silent. Okay. Yeah, they're probably silent. In fact, one the number one uh company in my portfolio from a multiple perspective, you know, was so silent that they didn't even want to even share everything work out because they want to keep it extremely like, you know, private. They didn't want to leak out mm-hmm. to two people. So Okay. But coachability, of course, is important, right? I mean, that's like so Ken, is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet, or, or anything else you want to talk about? Um, I think we talked about yeah, you know, my, my love for uh, neuroscience and AI. Um, I think health is super important. I think that's one thing I realize now that I'm optimizing for is like you know, but I think we covered a lot. So yeah, that was fun. Nice. Hey, can you share your social media links or any way for people to reach out to you? I mean, I'm just LinkedIn. You can look at me at Ken Morimoto. I'm like the only Ken Morimoto. Nice. So. Hey, Ken, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. You do some great things. Awesome. You as well. Yes. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.